Welcome to Criminal AF. For those of you joining the show for the first time, you're about to be introduced to a couple of somewhat funny guys from Connecticut who love to talk about true crime and have some fun doing it. While Criminal AF is best described as a comedic informative true crime podcast, there will be detailed descriptions of murder, rape, torture, and any other crime that would haunt you in your sleep. Criminal AF is made by adults for adults, so there will be adult conversations and there will be vulgar language. Like fuck. You know, the way most adults speak. The intention of Criminal AF is to keep the atmosphere light, fun, and inclusive, but they will not withhold any information, regardless of how brutal, disgusting, or gut-wrenching it may be. Now, it's understandable that Criminal AF is not for everyone, which is okay, but it's asked that you at least give it a listen. If it's not for you, well, thanks for checking it out. See ya. But if it is... Welcome to the debauchery. The kidnapping of Samantha Koenig was just the beginning of a much more terrifying story than anyone could imagine. A story that goes back several years and crosses thousands of miles. Stories of arson, armed robbery, rape, and murder. All told by Samantha's kidnapper himself, a man by the name of Israel Keys. Join us as we revisit our very first episode together as Criminal AF and hopefully improve upon it. (laughs) I'm Dave Jari. I'm Gary Corder. And this is Criminal as Fuck. What's good, all you fuckers out there? And welcome back to another episode of Criminal AF. Once again, I'm Dave Jari. And with me, as always, is my co host, Garrett Corder. How we doing? This episode is brought to you by Factor. Factor helps you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all of your holiday to-dos. These are just a few reasons why Factor is America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Stay tuned to learn how you can save big on your first month of Factor. I'm so excited to be working with Factor, you know? Me too, me too. I just love their meals so much. They're so fucking good. Next, we got to give a huge shout out to the magnificent Jessica Vi for becoming the newest member of our fucked up family. Thank you so much, Jessica. You're the best. Now, for all of the housekeeping, head on over to criminalasfuck.com for all of your criminal AF needs. Check out all of our episodes, videos, Patreon, reviews, and all in one place. And of course, we can't forget about our merch. Go get you some merch. Yes, sir. And don't forget to visit all of our friends over at WelcomeToTheDebauchery.com where you can find a plethora of independent podcasts joined together to create one beautiful podcast world. It's magnificent. Uh, we have ourselves, Criminal AF, Fright Flick FMK, True Crime University, the soon-to-be-released Para Abnormal, and Chat Suey. And the list goes on. So go show some love at WelcomeToTheDebauchery.com. So let's take a minute to listen in to Debbie from True Crime University. So you like to listen to people talk about crime. I do. But I do, Debbie. Did you ever wonder why criminals hmm. do the things they do? Like what makes them tick? Good question. My name is Debbie, and I'm the professor at True Crime University. Join me in the classroom Thursday, the wherever you get your podcasts, for intellectual discussions about crime, psychology, and why criminals do what they do. Mm. See you there. See you, Debbie. You know, if you go and listen to the most recent episodes of True Crime University, parts three and four of The Freeway Killer, you may hear a recognizable voice. Not saying it's me playing the role of William Bonin, <laughs> but it might be me. Dave's taking an acting career. Yeah. <laughs> He's taking it very serious right now. Uh, hey, we got to diversify. You know what I mean? Finally, and possibly most importantly, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Good Pods and leave us a five-star rating, a positive review, and be sure to share with your family and friends. It costs you absolutely nothing to do, but just a mere moment of your day, and it will help us immensely in spreading the word that Criminal AF is the number one true crime podcast in the world. (laughs) Dave, I'm so happy we're doing this episode over again, by the way, guys. Oh, my God. Let me tell you. Um, yeah. I mean, both of us, we just worked a 12-hour shift yeah. overnight, and it then we're now, still, we still have enough energy it's to now come. It's 7 a.m. And because we've talked about this episode, it's been a thorn in our side, and every time we listen to it, we cringe. I can't even listen to it. I don't know how you yeah. literally listen to it. Yep. And we just, we want, we want redemption. <laughs> and we're going to get it today. <laughs> even get- after not sleeping. And we love you guys so much. Yes. We'll work a 12-hour shift. 
come right back right into studio episode, chloroform. Right back into studio chloroform. Now, granted, it's not bad coming here because we have personal masseuses. Yeah. Uh, we have the the fish that like eat the skin cells off your. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the ball massage? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, only the finest here at <laughs> Studio only, only the finest testicle massager mm. ever. So, with that being said, we did Connecticut Man last week. Yeah, yeah, because it ended I, up in Connecticut. Connecticut. Connect, yeah. And uh, you know, we, let's we, we like to diversify here. It's, yeah, your yeah, fav- yeah. it's your favorite word here on Criminal AF. Yeah, diversify. So, I think it's only right mm-hmm. since Israel Keys is the man of Alaska. <laughs> let's do an Alaskan man. Yeehaw! Do they do they eat hard? I don't know. Reporting live from Alaska. <laughs> Alaskan <laughs> bank robber who was busted counting cash outside tried scheme again and failed. <laughs> He's ca- he robbed a bank and counted his cash yeah. outside. Couldn't even wait. No. <laughs> this is the most low energy. Now, it, for granted, it's co- it, It's cold out there. It is cold. So everybody's low energy out in Alaska, I feel like. I would imagine. So their bank robbers are probably slow, too. Yes. An Alaskan bank robber who was caught immediately after his heist while counting his loot outside the targeted branch was nabbed again Monday, trying to rob the same bank. <laughs> wow, he's really so, so he, he got, didn't he, even want to put the effort in finding a new spot uh, to rob. Uh, so he robbed the bank. I got arrested counting the cash. Counting the cash outside. Got out. Yep. And then rob. <laughs> tried to rob the same. Bank. <laughs> Michael Gale Nash, 49, was swiftly taken into custody for carrying out the failed scheme that closely resembled his fumble from five years earlier. Oh, oh it was five it was years. Five years, okay. The botched 2018 burglary ended him in a spot on at least one of the dumbest criminals list after he slipped a teller a demand note with his name and birth date scrawled. <laughs> scroll. <laughs> no, he that. didn't. No, no, he didn't. All right, when are we going to say that this no. guy has a little bit of a learning disability <laughs> or something, right? Like, you can't be... I like to rob you back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Give me all your money. Clad in black jeans, black boots, and a black car hard jacket and a black hat, oh. Nash allegedly s- sauntered up to the first national. Sauntered. Bank. <laughs> That's a great word. Sauntered up to a na- first national bank. I, I picture it like when I hear sauntered, I, I I picture like like he's all dressed in black, like he's the tip, stereotypical bad guy, you know. Yeah, and he's got like the cowboy boots with the little stir- uh, the little uh, the stirrups, the chingy things on the back. Yeah, the stirrups. Yeah. Stick him up, pal. You see like a fucking tumbleweed roll by. <laughs> Sauntered. Like, That's a great word. Yeah. I might actually start using that one in my uh, <laughs> everyday vocabulary. All right, up to the First National Bank in uh, and Anchorage at 9 a.m. and began violently pulling on the front door. Oh. Employees told Nash through the glass that the bank would not open for another hour, but he stood his ground and passed a note through the locked door to a bank <laughs> supervisor. What are we doing? This, this has got to be a joke. This dude, no way. This has got to be a joke, right? This dude. This is a robbery. Put the money in the bag and I will walk out. Walk out. You're already outside. You can't get in, dipshit. Uh, this is a robbery. God help us all. The note read. Oh, no. Oh. Throw oh, some, yeah, throw some faith-based stuff in there. That'll yeah. work. According to his arrest affidavit, it does not appear that Nash included his personal information on the note this time around. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's well, learning. He, he learned. His progression, he's learning. His progression. The supervisor immediately yelled from the bank's door to be locked via the secondary locking mechanism and called 911, but Nash continued loitering in front of the bank. This <laughs> dude. He's, yeah, he, there's clearly some mental health there going on. Be, yeah, there's, there's something. Meth, something. A nervous and stuttering Nash allegedly rejected a bank security officer's plea for the robber to leave and instead encouraged him to call the police. (laughs) I'm so confused. Oh, my God. When they finally arrived, Nash peacefully submitted and was transported to Anchorage Police Department precinct. While he was being put in handcuffs and while he was in the back of the patrol car, Nash made several excited utterances that it was not his first time robbing a bank. Meth. 100%. Oh, yeah. 100% meth. Officers later recounted to FBI investigators. FBI Anchorage ran, uh, ran a records check for Michael Gale Nash. The records check revealed that Nash was arrested, charged, and convicted for robbing the same FNB <laughs> in 2018. So the affid- that is affidavit. Fucking wild affidavit. Affidavit. Although he followed a near identical MO, the Monday morning holdup was not as nearly as effective as the 2018 heist. I know. At least he made some money last time. Nash made off with $400 Whoa. in a bag. Four hundred dollars, dude. Man. That's so. Four hundred dollars is not worth. That, no. Going to jail. No. For robbery. 
That's like when you get anybody who doesn't have a concealed carry pistol permit or yeah. anything like that, they, yeah. they, you know, you are technically allowed to try to stop a robbery. There's no shot on oh, no. risking getting no. in a shootout or anything for what's in the cash register right. of a gas station. People that yeah. do that are crazy to me. Right. Like, Just let that fucking happen. Let, let them take the fucking 100 and 200 bucks and go. Right. Nash made off with $400 in a bag after handing the teller a note on a completed form from affordable housing reading. <laughs> This is a holdup. Please put the money. They want it in the bag. God help us all. After just a few minutes. So he wrote the same note. Twice. Twice. Okay. Maybe schizophrenia? I don't even know. know. Manic depression? I don't know. After just a few minutes, Nash was spotted sitting outside the bank counting the bills. (laughs) For the crime, he was given 366 day prison term, followed by five years of supervised release. He could be sentenced up to 20 years in prison this time around. Whoa. What? I mean, clearly the guy has... That's something. Well, what the fuck? <laughs> he fucking robs a bank and comes back five years later. <laughs> yeah, he, this guy's definitely up there with the, the worst criminals. Almost yeah. almost like the, the Idaho killer and those guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a, he's a, actually, up, he's an upper echelon of, uh, of a criminal. Update two on that. <laughs> I just heard that there's a, there's a strong possibility of him getting off. Really? Yeah. There's, some technicality? Yeah. Like there's some, there's, there, it, I just saw, I just saw a whole update on that whole thing. Shut the yeah. fuck up. He could walk from that craziness. Like not because he's innocent, because of a technicality. I, yeah, I think it's a technicality. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I just I just saw an update on it. I don't know. I've always said that there, we'll have to look into. There it was more. There. there was more than one. Somebody. Somebody else is involved in that shit. We don't know. I always said that. All right. All right. Yeah. So there's your Alaska man. Fucking. Not a lot of fucking uh, <laughs> brain cells up in that fucking. I mean, if it if it's Florida, Florida fits with Alaska. Yeah. If you think about it. Yeah. All right, so we're going back to our very first episode together as Criminal AF. Uh, the original episode, as we uh, as we already discussed, has been a thorn in, in our side since it first aired. You know, at the time we didn't we hadn't uh, developed any on air chemistry yet. You know, even though we've been friends for years, I didn't even know I, that was never that was the first time I talked into a mic for a podcast setting at all. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just it's a lot different because like you know you that was your first time ever like actually recording, and for me. It was the first time having a camera in my face. Mm. You know what I mean? So it was like very, very fuck. You know, there's a lot of pressure to perform, you know, kind of like when you hook up with your crush for the first time. Oh, right? yeah. You know, you're like, you're overthinking, you're trying hard to do everything right. And then next thing you know, fucking 27 seconds pass by and you're a fucking pump, huge, too, too huge disappointment. And then you're <laughs> fucked. You're not getting a second date. <laughs> That's right. So that was episode one. I think us. the pressure is the, the hardest part. Yeah. And that goes for first time sex and everything. Podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> you got to bring the hammer, and we right. definitely didn't bring the hammer on yeah. that. Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, we didn't bring the hammer, and we still had our socks on. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's jump right into this episode and start fucking it in the mouth, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Fucking it in the mouth. Uh, all right. On the blistery morning of February second, two thousand twelve, a barista arrived at the Common Grounds Coffee Stand located at six thirty East Tudor Road in Anchorage, Alaska, to start their shift. At first, nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary. Uh, when she walked in, that is when things seemed to be a bit odd. The alarm wasn't set, and it just appeared that the young woman who closed the stand the night before uh, didn't do their nightly cleanup du- duties. Uh, there were cups and cleaning towels still on the counter, and the closer's belongings were still in her cubby. There was also a note asking if she would be needed the coming weekend to work. You know, saying, hey, anybody need me? You know, just let me know. You know, things appeared odd, but not too concerning. Uh, then it was business as usual. You know, just went about the day, running the coffee stand, you know, until it wasn't business as usual. News quickly spread by the afternoon that the young woman who worked the last shift the night before, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig, was reported missing by her father. Detectives went to Samantha's last known location, the coffee grounds. They asked to review the security footage from the night before, and what was revealed turned the missing persons case into a kidnapping. Boom, boom, boom. Dun, dun, dun. In the footage, you see a man walking up to the Common Ground shack wearing a mask and a hood. He approached the window shortly before 8 p.m. Samantha, restocking items and wiping down the countertops, turns to the window and is seen speaking to the man. There's no volume, you know, there's no sound. No sound. Uh, Samantha turns away, begins to prepare a coffee. Over the next minute or so, Samantha seems to be conversing with the man as she's going about completing the order. Uh, She hands the man the coffee, turns briefly, looks back at the window, and is startled. She raises her hands as the man, off camera, appears to draw a, a gun. 
Uh, based on her actions, it appears he instructs Samantha to turn out the lights and lock the back door. Samantha returns to the window and stands in fear as the man drops the bag through the window. She next opens the cash register, removes all of the money, and places it inside the bag. He instructs Samantha to kneel on the floor as another three minutes pass while pedestrians and other vehicles went by the vicinity of the kiosk. Uh, when all is clear, he entered through the window, begins rummaging around, and stands behind Samantha and restrains her wrists. They wait for a while inside the kiosk, apparently waiting for other pede pedestrians to clear the area, but we will learn there is a more sinister reason, reason for, for the waiting. Uh, he pulls Samantha up off the floor and leads her to the back of the kiosk towards the door. As she passes by the light of the cash register, you see that she is gagged as well, as the man had stuffed napkins into her mouth. They exit the back door and cross the parking lot, the man holding Samantha close to him. Just before they're out of view, it appears that Samantha breaks free and tries to escape, but she is quickly subdued. In a stroke of bad luck, Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne Tortolani, who was scheduled to pick her up at 8 p.m. and would have most likely prevented the kidnapping from happening, was slightly delayed at his job and missed Samantha by a mere minutes. According to his statement, when he arrived at the common grounds at about 8.33 p.m., the small coffee stand appeared to be closed. Dwayne claims he got out of his truck to look inside the window and noticed napkins on the floor and dirty towels still on the counter. Very uncharacteristic of Samantha. You know, that guy probably has to live with that if I was just on time for yeah. the rest of his life. Yep, if I didn't get held up. So he claims that the uh, windows had wooden boards placed in the rails to prevent the sliding windows from opening. You know how you, like, you do that like when you slide a glass door and you rig up like Old a broomstick stick or yeah. something? Yeah. But he didn't check the back door for fear of setting off the alarm. He just assumed that Samantha had already been picked up, so he went to her home where she lived with her father, James Koenig. Both James and Dwayne tried repeatedly to get in contact with her to no avail. Later that evening at 11.24 p.m., Dwayne received a text message from Samantha's phone stating verbatim, F you asshole. I know what you did. I'm going to spend a couple of days with friends. These are with typos included. Need time to think, plan, actig, weird. Let my dad know. Actig. All right, so this was also out of character of Samantha uh, because she had a... Yeah, like her boyfriend doesn't know how she texts. Right, like exactly, yeah. yeah. It, it, it did raise a red flag. Like, who the fuck was this? Uh, so, yeah, so this was out of character for Samantha who had a strong relationship with her father. Um, why wouldn't she just tell James herself? You yeah. know what I mean? Why are you texting him? Another text came in at 11.53 p.m. from Samantha's phone simply saying, F you. Okay? Like, the you. Yeah, lingo. Like a boomer texting. <laughs> no, I got that as like a fucking 12-year-old fucking texting. Anyway, really? Yeah. Mm. It's opposite there. <laughs> as the night turned into the early morning hours, Dwayne heard a noise outside and noticed a man rummaging, rummaging through his truck. He yelled at the man and retreated to the house to get help. When he and James returned, the man was gone. The next day on the 2nd, James contacted police to report Samantha missing. The same day, the owner of the Common Grounds coffee stand had called Anchorage Police at approximately 12.39 in the afternoon to state that while reviewing surveillance video from the night before, he saw Samantha Koenig being kidnapped. On February 3rd, Anchorage Police requested the assistance of the FBI in the investigation into the robbery and kidnapping of Samantha Koenig. Now, a few days had passed between Samantha being seen on CCTV at the Common Grounds and the next surveillance video recorded across the street in the Home Depot parking lot. It shows Samantha and a man walking past a group of people standing in the parking lot before the two get into a white Chevy truck. Now, finding this truck would be a daunting task because, you know, it's fucking Alaska. Everybody has a fucking truck. Oh, probably a white pickup truck. It's so, probably a white truck, yeah. Real so, quick, too, shout out to uh, mm -hmm. in the local police department for actually asking the FBI for yeah. help. Because how many stories do we have that are completely botched by oh, local yeah. PDs? Yeah. They're like, like, no, nah, we got this. No, nope. we got it. But at least they just, handle. they... They pass it off like, right. no, this is this is getting serious. Yeah, obviously this is something more than we. Uh, can you think handle. it's an ego thing for those small town PDs? Oh, like, that's right. our, this is our big break. Yeah, 100%. it's like um, it's like uh, when they find out that uh, volunteer firefighters are usually firebugs. Oh yeah, yeah. You, they like, set the arson. They're yeah. the ones who set the fires. Right, right. To, like, oh yeah, put them, put them. Uh, Ring a ding ding, fucking sheriff's department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're like, this nope. Is, this is our break. This is my crime. I'm gonna make a name. I had an election coming up. Yeah. I'm gonna make a name for myself. I'm trying to run for city council. <laughs> <laughs> Criminal AF would be back after this quick break.
Now back to Criminal AF. All right, so these two surveillance videos were the only two definitive leads detectives would have until 22 days later. On February 24th, Dwayne received a text from, from Samantha from her phone that read, Connor Park sign under pick of Albert. Ain't she purty? P-O-R-T-Y, purty. Ain't she purty? Detectives were notified of Ugh. the text, and they all raced to Connor's bog park. They approached the signboard at the entrance of the park, and underneath a posting for a lost dog named Anya. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's so funny that what the people listening at home didn't realize is that we just cut and then spent an hour chasing my dog through my neighborhoods. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, the little shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, keep going. All right, so, yeah, so they, so they approached the signboard at the entrance of the park, and underneath a posting for a lost dog named Albert, they discovered a ransom note and a proof-of-life photo showing Samantha. Her hair braided and appearing to look off into the distance. A newspaper dated February 13th with aught was also shown. The ransom note demanded $30,000 to be deposited into Samantha's bank account. Now, a side note, um, apparently the, the proof of life photo of Samantha that is all over the internet um, is actually a recreation. Oh, so it's not real. So I was going to say, real, you yeah. definitely have to include that picture because it's kind of chilling it is very chilling yeah i mean you can see the bruising around the neck i'm sure i'm sure we could find the real one it's never been released oh it hasn't no Mm. well allegedly it's never been released uh which makes sense because when i was looking through the fbi's uh page for freedom of information act releases Mm -hmm. for this case uh the ransom note and the photo had been redacted gotcha which is weird to me because they won't release all of the information regarding this murder but there's going to be a murder later on in a story where they just spilled the entire fucking beans. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, so it's weird. I don't. I don't. I don't get it. Why tell the whole world about the whole like one murder, but withhold? Was she? Was she how old was she? Eighteen. I wonder if they were treating it like a minor, because you know how they don't. Maybe. So, I, yeah. You never know. Yeah, if she's I, over eighteen, then it should be. We know because of the circumstances of the picture. Maybe. Yeah. That's why they redacted it. Because mm, I mean. Possible. Yeah. We didn't. We never got to see those Polaroids. I just want to see the picture. I just want to see some fucking yeah. pictures. <laughs> All right. So under the FBI's advice, only a portion of the ransom was deposited, and they waited for further communication, and waited, and waited. And a few days later, on March first, two thousand twelve, Samantha's debit card was used to withdraw five hundred dollars from an ATM at an Anchorage bank. Police were immediately dispatched to the bank, but they were too late. Surveillance from the location only showed a man in a white truck wearing a hood and a mask. Then more silence and more waiting. Risky. Yeah. He's really, I mean, he's not smart either. Yeah. So that all changed on March 7th, 2012, when the bank notified authorities that there was more activity on Samantha's card. Dude, you go you go and try to take out money with her car at, card after she, you know she's missing. Yeah. You go back to her house and try to break into her dad's truck. Yeah. Like, what do what you... What? Yeah. Just take your wins and go. I mean, I wouldn't call them wins. That's horrible. But you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, to him, they were. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Now, surprisingly, uh, this activity was 3,800 miles away in Wilcox, Arizona. Then the card pinged again on March 8th in Lordsburg, New Mexico, and again in Shepard, Texas, the same day. Shepard, Texas. The last activity was on March 10th in Humble, Texas. Each time, surveillance showed the same mysterious figure except in Texas, where they could see that the driver was driving a white Ford Focus. Okay. On March 13th, 2012, a Texas Highway Patrol corporal saw the vehicle in question parked in a hotel parking lot in Lufkin, Texas. He watched as a man walked from the hotel to the white Ford Focus and drove off. The corporal followed and waited for the driver to make a traffic violation. When the driver was clocked going two miles over the speed limit... (laughs) He was waiting for it. Yep. He initiated a traffic stop. The driver gave him an Alaskan driver's license, and he knew right away we had his man. He requested backup and waited until they arrived. They completed a probable cause search of the vehicle inside the trunk. Uh, Clothes that matched the ATM footage were found, but what really made their hair stand up was that they found the cell phone and ATM card belonging to Samantha Koenig. Signed, sealed, delivered. Now, the man was identified as Israel Keyes, and he was now in custody, and there was some deliberation between authorities and Keyes' attorneys about what he was willing to discuss, 
and he agreed to tell authorities about the night Samantha was kidnapped. But he had demands. He would not speak to authorities until he had an Americano coffee, a peanut butter Snickers, and a cigar. Man, that's class. Yeah, that's classy. Yep. Yeah, peanut butter Snickers, though, that's not, that's kind of weird. That'd be my first red flag right there. I'd be like, all right, this guy's a serial killer. Yeah. <laughs> peanut, butter, peanut butter Snickers over a classic? Oh. <laughs> that's so funny, though. That's your demands to yeah. talk. I'll tell you everything. I Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you everything about this girl. I just want a fucking Snickers, bro. Yeah. Give me a, give me a coffee, a Snickers, and a cigar. All right, so keep in mind, uh, we will most likely never know the full extent of Samantha's suffering that night, as the complete information of her ordeal has been heavily redacted, but the words torture and necrophilia have been whispered. Yeah. Okay. Keyes claims that in the days leading up to Samantha's kidnapping, he scouted several locations to commit robbery, including other common grounds locations. Allegedly, he was experiencing recent financial difficulties due to a harsh winter and not having a lot of sustainable work for his uh, construction business. He decided to ride the East Tudor, Tudor Road uh, location because it was open later than the others, and although the location was on an active street, a recent snowfall had occurred, and the snow banks were high enough to block the view from the road. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, he states that he didn't know who Samantha was prior to the evening of February 1st, 2012, and that he wasn't even sure he would go along with the robbery until he got to the window and saw that she was alone. It was at that moment, Keyes decided that he was not only going to rob the coffee stand, but he was also going to kidnap, rape, and kill Samantha Koenig. It's a big uh, jump from just robbing a, armed robbing robbery. A place. Yeah. yeah. Now, there was a moment I described earlier where I said that once Israel Keys was inside the coffee stand and restrained Samantha, it appeared that they were lay, laying in wait, you know, for the coast to be clear or whatever. Now, Keys describes that moment, saying that he knew Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne, was going to be arriving to pick Samantha up. Oh. And when he did... Keys was going to kidnap and murder him as well. Uh, he, you know, he probably gained that information from her. From her, my boyfriend's coming. Leave yeah. me alone. Like he's going to be here any minute. Okay, well, I'll kill him too. That, but when Dwayne uh, failed to show up, Keys changed his mind again and left the coffee stand with uh, Samantha in tow. We also discussed before that when Dwayne finally did arrive, he stated that he got out of his truck and checked out the coffee stand, which I guess technically he did, except according to outside surveillance footage. He never got out of his truck, as claimed, and he was only at the coffee stand for a total of eight whopping seconds. Huh? He probably, that means he's, he, wait, 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 so he drove in, saw the lights were off, and we're like, oh, guess you got a ride home. Yeah, peeked in the fucking window through his fucking, uh. You know what these are remind me, you know, have you ever seen, like, the bikini baristas? That are like in Florida and stuff like that. Yeah, like it's like shacks. it's a shack with yeah. a chick in a bathing suit. Yeah, like it just this. I'm terrified for them because of this story. Oh yeah, yeah. Like that's yeah. got to be like the creepiest mm-hmm. motherfuckers in the world going to that. Th- oh like, yeah, yeah. This is literally a shack in the middle of a fucking parking lot. That's all <sighs> it is. I don't know. Yeah. So after Keys took Samantha, we also described that she was she briefly broke away. Now Keys tackled her to the ground and held the barrel of a 22 uh, pistol to her side, telling her to cooperate. Because he will kill her, and the twenty-two caliber makes very little noise, which is true. Yes. It's like a pea shooter. It's like, Plus, you don't want to <laughs> get killed by a twenty-two because you're probably not going to die. Yeah, it'll take a lot of it'll 22s. It'll take a lot of 22s. It'll take a lot of 22s. So they walked across the street where his truck was parked in the Hope Depot parking lot. Uh, there was another potential problem when they arrived as there was a group of people hanging out by a car parked just in front of them. Keys pushed a barrel into of the twenty two deeper into Samantha's side and again said he will kill her if she drew any attention. Uh, he told her to act drunk so it wouldn't raise suspicions as to why he was holding her so close. Uh, once in the truck, they drove off. He explained to her that she was being held for ransom, and if she went along with his demands, she would be returned to her family unharmed. Do you go along with those plans if you have a gun to your side like that and you're in a public area like that? Uh, Absolutely not. No, I I, I, no. I call his bluff. I will fall to the ground. Well, first get the, you know, you drop out to yeah. get the gun out up from your side. Yeah, and then if you're gonna kill me, kill me in front of everybody. Yeah, like fucking uh, do it. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I go along with those. Well, there's another point too where I would be fucking fighting back, raising a fucking stink. So they drove around town to pass the time because Keys was planning on bringing Samantha back to his house where his girlfriend Kimberly and his daughter were still awake. Ugh. 
At one point during the drive, they were stopped at a red light when a police car pulled up to the passenger side of the truck. Ever, yep. There was tension inside the truck. Second time that she fucked up. And Keyes reminded her of his previous threat, that he would kill her if she made any noise, and advised her not to make a scene. That's so sad to know. Shortly that. after, the police car drove away. It's so sad to know that your, your escape was right there. Two or three opportunities where you could have just said, fuck you. I'm, if, yeah, if I'm I, yelling, screaming, kicking, punching. I'm doing fucking everything. If, especially with, like, girls who get kidnapped don't usually make it back. Correct. So it's like, you ha- like you, that has to be going through your mind at that point. You have yeah. to, like, it, you, if you're going to do it, do yeah. it. I'm going to call your bluff every time. Yeah. I'm going to make it... If you're going back to someone's house, you're not... Yeah. I'm going to make it uh, as impossible as, as possible yes. <laughs> for you to fucking kidnap me. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. going to make your life a living fucking hell. Because you hear a lot of, especially, uh, who was it? The toolbox killers. Oof. Like, a lot of those girls were just like, they were... They just accepted their fate, yeah. you know? Well, then that's another thing, too, is I would much rather die by being shot oh, yeah. than being slowly tortured to death and raped and... And stabbed in the ear so, with a fucking ice pick. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, come on. Let's get in a gunfight, I guess. Yep. Far away. Uh, Keys realized that Samantha didn't have her cell phone, and he needed it to carry out his new plan. Samantha said that she left it back at the coffee stand. <laughs> So they drove back to the common grounds where he bound her inside the truck and he went inside to retrieve it. Uh, Keys scrolled through her phone and saw the numerous messages from her dad, James, and from Dwayne. Uh, Keys realized that she and Dwayne had been fighting recently, mainly over him talking to other girls. Mm. So Keys sent the previously mentioned text message to Dwayne's phone, basically telling him to fuck off and that she'll be with friends for a few days. Uh, He then removed the battery. Uh, he asked her where her debit card was. Uh, Samantha explained that she and her boyfriend shared an account, and he had the card inside his truck behind the visor. She told him where her house was and the passcode to her card. At this time, it was late enough in the evening where Keyes' girlfriend and daughter would be sleeping. They went to his house. He restrained Samantha in, the, in his truck. Uh, he had a police scanner with him, and he told her that he would know if she tried to escape and if somebody tried to call the cops or whatever, he would <sighs> know, right? So he went inside his house to check on Kimberly and his daughter to make sure they were sleeping. He uh, came back outside and took Samantha to the shed where he had previously prepared it uh, to restrain a potential victim by screwing eye bolts into the frame to withhold to hold restraints. It's it always amazes me about these these killers that have families. Like, why are you not questioning what your husband is doing? If I came home, I'm telling you, my wife. At like nine o'clock at night, we'd be like, "What are you? What are you doing?" And I'm like, "Uh, nothing. Hey, I'm gonna hang out. I'm gonna go back outside. Uh, yeah. I'll be back." What? But Kelly would be if like, "If you what? came home from work at seven ten, Kelly would probably be like, what did you do? What happened? What? Yeah, what are you doing? Don't worry. You're and supposed like, to be here. Don't worry. You're supposed I'm, to hear be here at seven oh seven. I'm out. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then and I'll be like, I'm out. No, I'm out, babe. I'm, I'm home. I'm home. I'm gonna yeah. go back outside in the shed for a little bit. Yeah. What? Okay. No. Okay, babe. What yeah. The fuck, what the hell? She'd be like, "Fuck you are." <laughs> That'd be so weird. Like, that would just be weird. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe I just, there's different relationships, I guess. I, I get, yeah. Well, I mean, apparently this guy traveled all over the fucking country yeah. without even fucking uh, any questions whatsoever. He bound her to a wall in the shed by her arms and neck, duct taped her mouth, and told her not to make any noise or try to escape. Again, reminding her of the police scanner and that he would know. Uh, he turned up the radio to drown out any noise she would possibly make. And he went back inside his house and drank some wine. Uh, he was in there, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Some red hour. wine. Yeah. Americano. Yeah. Red wine, Americano, and a Snickers. Why are you puffing on a cigar? Uh, he then returned to the shed with a glass of water. Uh, Key said Samantha was very compliant and at ease when he returned. And she asked him if she had spoken to her father and if he was going to get the ransom money. Uh, Keys replied that he did and everything was being taken care of. Keys then released Samantha from her restraints and gave her some water. Uh, Keys stated that she was very relaxed at this point. Right? But, psych! In a split second, Keys then flew into a rage, grabbing her aggressively and restraining Samantha's wrists even tighter than before. Oof, that's a chilling moment. The brief moment of kindness in the story he told her was a lie, a psychological game to fuck with her head. Keys then savagely raped Samantha noting to the authorities that there was a sense of resignation by Samantha that she knew what was about to happen next. She asked Keyes, you're going to kill me now, aren't you? And he replied, yes, I am. 
He then drove a knife into Samantha's back and strangled her to death. Uh, Keys rolled up Samantha's body in a tarp and moved her towards the back of the shed and placed some items on top of her. He then checked one more time on his girlfriend and daughter, and with them still sleeping, he left for Samantha's house to retrieve her debit card. Uh, Keys was inside with uh, Dwayne's truck when he came outside and spotted him. He was he was the mystery man. Uh, Keys was parked uh, further down the road and was able to retrieve the card and leave the area before anyone came back. Uh, in, a, in an interview uh, with Dwayne back on February 2nd, Dwayne acknowledged going to sleep after this brief encounter with the man. Uh, he said that he slept from 4.30 a.m. to about 9.20 a.m. When asked why he didn't report the disappearance of Samantha, the strange text messages, or the break-in of his truck, Dwayne replied that he didn't think police would do anything until after 24 hours. Uh, I mean, he's not wrong. You basically skim the fucking kiosk to check for your girlfriend and you drive away after eight seconds, and she's still missing. Creepy shit's happening. A dude mm-hmm. just broke into your truck. Eh, I think I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to go to bed. I, no, it's, it's not wrong, but he is right about the argument of the 24 hours. Right. But you're right. If all, like, there's not that many coincidences in the same. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I just thought that was weird. All right. So after getting the debit card from the truck, he's then went to a. You know, what's interesting, too, is that he's not really that much of an Alaskan man to me. If, if somebody's break. Yeah. I, I no, uh and Dwayne. Dwayne. Yeah. Because if somebody was breaking in my truck, like I, you, you get that picture of, a, yeah, you picture an Alaskan dude. He's not running back inside and going and getting help from her boyfriend. Yeah, no. You know what I mean? He's yeah. he's carrying a shotgun. He's cut. Yeah, it's, he's coming out. Yeah, get, get, the, get the fuck, get the my fuck out of my truck! Boom. Yeah, that's not. Like, that sounds like more of an Alaskan man. Uh, oh man. So after getting the debit card from the truck, Keys then went to a bank to make sure that Samantha gave him the correct passcode and returned to his house. Upon his return, Keys then went inside the house where he showered and woke up his daughter and girlfriend as they were leaving for a cruise that day. Ugh. How do you have a daughter and do that? Uh, it's crazy to me. Samantha's body remained in the shed in sub-zero temperatures until his return on February 17th. Keys noted that Samantha's body was very well preserved and thawed Samantha's body with a hair dryer and space heaters. This is where the whispers of necrophilia come into the conversation. Not confirmed, but... Why did he thaw her out? Hmm. All right, so when questioned about this, uh, about the whole necrophilia situation, uh, Keys would refuse to answer and change the subject immediately. Didn't want to talk about it. We're not discussing this hey we 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 were just talking about this probably two episodes ago about how every single one of them the necrophilia deny it or or downplay it downplay it yeah we'll never know for sure if this did occur but based on his response or lack thereof uh it's probably safe to assume that he most likely did you know have sex with a dead body after it's it's so interesting that that's the line Mm. you'll admit to everything but i didn't have sex with that body oh no, 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 no 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 absolutely not uh keys then washed her up Braided her hair like he did to his daughters. Applied oh, come on, Dave. You did that in the first time, and it <laughs> still fucks me up when you said That was the exact same line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, applied makeup God, to her face and sewed Samantha's eyelids open with fishing line. He then held up a newspaper from February 13th and took her photo. After he posted the ransom note and proof of life, quote unquote, at Connors Bog Park and text Samantha's boyfriend, Keys returned to the shed and dismembered her body. He gathered his fishing gear and over the course of three separate trips, drove her dismembered remains 35 miles away to Matanuska Lake. Uh, While Keys was ice fishing, he systematically dumped Samantha's body parts into the fishing hole. Uh, When he returned to the house, he cooked the fish that he had caught for his girlfriend and daughter. On March 6th, Keys took a flight to Las Vegas, Nevada and rented a car for a trip to Texas for his sister's wedding. During this trip, it was when Keyes used Samantha's ATM card several times, which led to his eventual arrest on March 13th. Wouldn't you know that the account would be shut off at that point, though? Or that they're tracking it? Like, I don't know. That's yeah. such strange behavior. It's right. almost like he wanted to get caught. Yeah. In a, in a weird way. Yeah, it's weird. Like, uh, yeah, I'm holding her for ransom. Put it in this secured offshore fucking whatever account. No. Just, just deposit the money into your fucking daughter's bank account. So after several hours of interrogation, Keyes told the authorities where they could find Samantha's remains. 
Good evening, everyone. The massive search for missing barista Samantha Koenig is over, but it's not the news family and friends were hoping for. Anchorage police announced today they found a body they believe to be Samantha Koenig's in Matanuska Lake out in the valley. Earlier today, a forensic dive team discovered in Matanuska Lake what investigators believe to be the body of Samantha Koenig. We have information that's led us out here and uh, we're actively following them up. Now, there has been some scrutiny into the initial investigation into Samantha Koenig's disappearance. Uh, as friends and family of Samantha say the police were wasting their time following false leads, but there was good reason. And I just want to preface this by saying that what I'm about to say is in no way victim shaming. Okay? I'm just putting it out there, but like, you know, like we always do, we like to tell the whole story. Okay? So all four main characters so far of this story have had their issues with illegal activity. Obviously, Israel Keys, mm -hmm. um, but also Samantha, her father James, and her boyfriend Dwayne were all believed to have dealings with the underbelly of Anchorage. Uh, James and Dwayne, in particular, had ties with known drug dealers in Anchorage, and police had acquired search warrants for James's house and other properties as part of the, of the investigation into drug dealing and whether Samantha had been kidnapped in retaliation to James's either owing money or having a dispute with known drug dealers higher up in the echelon of Anchorage, the drug world. Right. Uh, police did find what is believed to have been a growing operation in the house uh, in a crawl space, but the area they believe this to uh, have occurred was dismantled just prior to their search. They did, however, find two 1,000 watt light bulbs, several pots, a uh, growing medium, which I didn't know at the time, but growing medium is like soil or yeah. whatever you grow your shit in. And marijuana shakes or small pieces of discarded marijuana plant material. So that Keith. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, too, some of those police officers that should have like, these fucking scumbags. They yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure cross their mind. Yeah. They would, what's the point? Why are we because, gonna... you know, if, if you look at other stories around this time of there was a, a very strong animosity coming from Samantha's father to the cop. To the police. Like and now, like, now you now the it, police. It, it makes sense of why he didn't call right away and all that right. sort of stuff. But at the same time, he's selling weed. He's growing weed. It's right. not like he's he's running a meth lab. Right. And, like, every, and every time they went to his house, hey, we got a couple more questions for you, he'd be like, like squeeze out the door. Like he wouldn't, wouldn't open up his door yeah. all the way. But still, like, yeah. like he's not a mastermind. He's not running a, a meth lab, dude. He's, right. he's growing some bud. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they interviewed well over 100 people during this time, and the common theme was that the Koenigs and their associates were involved somehow with the Anchorage drug trade, though no arrests have been made during that investigation. Just want to make that clear. No, no arrests have been made, so whatever. Also, during their initial investigation, several people, along with Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne, noted that Samantha had a long-standing battle with cocaine addiction. While she was currently in recovery at the time of her kidnapping and murder, many stated on record that Samantha's repeated regressions were a common theme, uh, supporting the theory of her kidnapping being part of a drug trade gone wrong. Yeah, or that she's hooked on coke. Yeah. Dwayne was also a focus of the initial investigation because it was learned through he and Samantha's phone records that they would fight often, mostly over Dwayne talking to and hanging out with other women. Uh, then there was the rapper. <laughs> <laughs> An Alaskan rapper. His name was Christopher Bird, a.k.a. White Tyson. White Tyson. He was the subject of a protective order filed by Samantha prior to her disappearance. Though she never followed through with the protective order, she claimed that Bird had uh, raped her, although there is no proof that this occurred. So those are just a few of the many rabbit holes that the Anchorage Police, Alaska State Police, and the FBI had to follow, all while Keys was on a Caribbean cruise with his daughter and girlfriend. So, and as I said, we're not victim shaming. We just want to touch on all aspects of this case. And you think he enjoyed himself on that cruise? Oh, I had a blast. You think so? Yeah. You don't think he just sat on the deck, looking over the ocean, just thinking about what he, what he did? Oh, I'm sure he did. He probably rubbed one out a few times. But as we'll, as we'll see throughout this, like, he has a very, like, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to move on. Yep. Do this and move on. Nonchalant. Yeah. yeah. Like it never, Definitely a sociopath. Like it never fucking happened. Criminal AF would be back after this quick break. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. 
Save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos with Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals, ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Too busy with holiday plans to cook but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. That's right. And I was ecstatic when we uh, partnered with Factor for one simple reason. Oh, yeah. The food is freaking amazing. It's good. Yeah. Like, I want to scream it from the mountaintops, to be serious. Like, every meal I've eaten from Factor hits all the senses. All of them. Before the show today, we received our latest box, and I had the Indian butter chicken with cilantro, lime, cauliflower rice. Bro, I thought my soul left my body. It was like an otherworldly experience. So freaking delicious. For me, dude, it's those damn smoothies. The strawberry banana smoothie from oh, Factor. Yeah. Is, the mango one is fantastic too, but yeah. there, there's something about that strawberry smoothie. I don't even, I'm not even a big smoothie guy, but Factor turned me into one. So that's the, the shining star in my bit. Oh, nice. So to enjoy eating well in just two minutes with no prep and no mess, head on over to factormeals.com backslash criminal AF50 and use code criminal AF50 to receive 50% off. That's code criminal AF50 at factormeals.com backslash criminal AF50 to receive 50% off. Factor, America's, America's number one ready to eat meal delivery service. <laughs> with the amount of graphic research I do for this show on my phone, tablet, and computer, if someone didn't know me, they'd think I was an active serial killer or someone really into death and murder. I mean, which I kind of am. But still, I don't want those who have no business seeing my online activity to gain access or to get hacked. That's why I use NordVPN. With NordVPN, I can avoid government tracking, hackers, and other forms of exploitation by allowing me to change my IP address, virtually disappearing on the web. So go to the show notes on this episode and click the link for NordVPN to receive 69% off plus three extra months. Now back to Criminal AF. All right, so back to Keyes. So after his confession and more deliberation, Keyes shocked investigators by admitting that Samantha was not his first victim. We'd like to control things. We'd like to control things as quietly as possible. We don't want FBI to study you. I don't want any of that shit. All I want is for this to sort of end. I think I, like I told you the first time, oh, let's, let's let it end for as many people as possible, and then you control. All right. Um, I'll give you two bodies and a name. So and, lucky. Uh, mm. But I'm not going to give you the rest. I'll, I'll give, that's all I'll give you today is two bodies and uh, a name. Last name, Courier, C-U-R-R-I-E-R. All right, so to understand how Israel Keyes got to this point, we need to look into his past a little bit. Keyes was born on January 7, 1978 in Cove, Utah. He was a second of 10 children born to Heidi and John Keyes. His parents were Mormons and had a mistrust of the government. The minute you said more uh, Utah and 10 children, I yeah. instantly went, oh, they're Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, so they, yep, yeah, 100% Mormons. Uh, they had a mistrust of the government, modern medicine, and as a result of this mistrust, homeschooled all of their children. Oh, yay. Yeah. No wonder he kept using the debit card. <laughs> they lived off the grid, uh, isolated from the modern world. They had no electricity or running water. Uh, when Keyes was five, his parents left the Mormon faith and moved to the family to Washington State. Uh, where they joined a church that was based on white supremacist ideology. <laughs> Dude, there's no way you go from Mormonism to a white supremacist church. Oh, yeah. yep. <laughs> You're just following cults. Oh, absolutely. Going from one cult to another. Yeah. They seem like great people. Yeah. <laughs> His parents. <laughs> so as Keyes grew older, he developed a fascination with guns and hunting and would often steal guns from neighbors. In his teen years, he moved from hunting animals to torturing them. He didn't realize his sadistic thoughts were any different from others who shared his same upbringing. I knew since I was 14 that there was there were things that um, that I thought were normal and that were okay that nobody else seems to think were normal and okay. You can laugh about it. So, um, Crazy. So, so that's when I just started being a loner, I guess. Just, uh, I got in trouble a few times around that age. People found out about some of the stuff I did, like my parents and parents of other kids who would hang out with me, they would find out about some of the stuff I did and... Um, and that's when I just started doing stuff by myself. He sounds so young in these, bits, these clips. Okay. Keeping it secret to yourself. Yeah, I never really. There was one. There was one kid 
uh, that I grew up with, and we used to break in houses together and mostly like kid stuff. And uh, but then uh, there was a time when I, uh, I think I shot I shot something. I think, I think it was a dog or a cat or something, and that was too much for him. He couldn't handle it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot. And of people. so after that, I, I wouldn't do anything illegal. I guess you could say with him. Mm-hmm. But before that, my parents, I used to carry a pistol all the time from the time I was about 14. And I mean, by the time I was 14, I was basically the same size I am now. I, was, I didn't really look 14, and so I could get away with, like, the houses, the guns I took from houses I broke into, I could get away with selling them, you know, without anybody knowing about it, without my parents knowing about it. And so I had a lot of guns, and I would always carry a gun, and... Uh, when I was 14, uh, there were some friends staying with us. This gets and there was uh, a cat of ours that was always getting into the trash. It was my sister's cat. And I told her at the time, I was like, if that cat gets into the trash again, I'm going to kill it. And so uh, there was this kid and some of the other, some of his, I think maybe one of my sisters and one of his sisters, we all went up into the woods and I had the cat with me. Took a piece of parachute cord and uh, tied it to this tree. Parachute cord was about 10 feet long and had a 22 revolver with me. I shot it in the stomach and it ran around and around the tree and then like, crashed into the tree and then started uh, started vomiting. And as soon as that, like for me, I didn't really react. I mean, I actually kind of laughed a little, I think, because of the way it was running around the tree. But then I looked over at everybody else, and the kid who was about my age was with me. He was he was throwing up, like he was like really, I don't know, <laughs> traumatized. I guess you would say. He laugh. <laughs> and he told he told his dad about it, and then of course his dad talked to my parents about it, and that was that was pretty much the last time anybody went in the woods with me. <laughs> hey, dude, all right, so a true sociopath there because. Yeah. Any like all right, so like you know, human beings, all we are, are just social experiences. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You try yeah. a little bit of that, you try a little bit. Of that. Oh, they, mm-hmm. oh, this they like this, they like that. Nope, they, they all, don't like. Let that. me do a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy just blatantly like shoots a cat and goes, huh, huh? Yeah. And, oh, <laughs> they didn't like that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Like yeah. he's just learning through social experiences. You can right. tell he's a total sociopath. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and obviously. Uh, <laughs> just raised outside. Huh? Of, you like that? <laughs> raised outside of like normal fucking oh. society. You know what I mean? What would what would you do if your friend did if, that? Yeah, if you uh, brought you out of the woods and then shot his cat, I would get the fuck out of there. You would? Yeah. What me, would you do? Me too. Yeah, I wouldn't hang around for that. Shit. No, I no, not. I'd be all. afraid he'd fucking shoot me. Well, I don't know. Do you stick around to try to be? Oh, like, I, I completely. Yeah. I yeah. will blow smoke up this guy's ass. Oh, yeah. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> wow, dude. That was the greatest thing. Wow, and then yeah. just run then, yeah. as soon as they're going to break away. <laughs> wow, man, you're so cool. That's wow, awesome. dude, you're That's fucking, awesome. you're the coolest. Can you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm completely, I'm doing, I'm saying whatever I need to to get yeah. out of that situation. Yep. All right, so around the age of 18, it's believed that Keyes committed his first, first violent uh, crime. He kidnapped a 14 or 15-year-old girl from her group on the Deschutes River in Oregon. He brought her to an outbuilding where he raped her and planned on killing her, yet the young girl was calm and talked to him, humanizing herself and cooling any urge that he had to kill. He let the girl go, later stating, quote, I was too timid. I wasn't violent enough. I made up my mind that I was never going to let that happen again. In July of 1998, Keyes and his family moved to Maine, where Keyes joined the army after having a falling out with his family when he renounced Christianity and told them that he was an atheist. Uh, In the Army, he was stationed at Fort Lewis in Washington, Fort Hood in Texas, and Egypt before leaving the service in 2001. It was during this time that Keyes admitted to murdering his first victims. Uh, No specifics were given, but Keyes said it was a couple in Washington State. Uh, These murders are still an open case. Uh, Soon after these murders, Keyes moved to Nia Bay, Washington, where he worked for the Parks and Rec Department and he met a native woman from the Makah tribe. Uh, Together, they had a daughter. In 2006, Keyes uh, claimed to have murdered two more victims. Uh, These also remain unsolved. Uh, By 2007, Keyes met another woman named Kimberly and moved to Alaska with her and his daughter. Uh, This is the same year he began making several trips around the country. 
Now it's kind of weird. People probably wonder, like, how did Keys get custody of his daughter and move to Alaska? Uh, I, hey, I was about to say that. Yeah. Uh, apparently, uh, the the mother uh, of the child uh, had some issues with drugs and, and and whatnot. So he had custody of her. Now it's believed that it was during this time that he would hide kill kits, which he called buried treasure, in various locations throughout the United States. A little memento. That's right. Uh, during these trips, he would also commit arson and rob banks, which funded his travel expenses. He paid for everything in cash and picked up items he needed for the buried treasures through home robberies. It's uh, That's the scariest, I feel like, serial killer. That's like a true serial killer that has mm-hmm. no pattern plan right. or anything. Mm-hmm. Goes state to state. Just on a whim. It's the hardest one to get. I know in one of our uh, conversations, you made uh, a comment about how people like buried treasure. And yeah, somebody yeah. somebody might find one of those someday and think it's their lucky day, and they hit the yeah. mother load. So it would be their lucky day. Would it? What's in it? Well, different things, but bank money. In, in it's way. not. It's nothing that will get them into trouble. So no loaded guns. No, I don't. I don't bury them loaded. I, I don't even think I usually bury them with the magazines loaded. I did that once, and then the, the springs were all screwed up after that. So. We like buried treasures also. We kind of, we kind of have fun with this. Great, so great, great investigator. Right to with yeah, I wanna, great I wanna, investigator. I want to put this out there. Like people, like when he when he listen to these these like our, you know, videos and stuff. Just, oh my god, what are they like best friends? And oh my god, it's so it's how can you talk point. to this man? It's the whole point. You want to be like. Like you, you, you're your best, his best yeah. friend. Hey, hey, you know, you, you know, welcome back. Do you want another cigar? You want another fucking Snickers? You know, we got everything you need. You know, you whatever sure? they do, yeah. we get them to talk. So you know, like joke around, and everything, and you want to put the fucking person at ease, like you're kind of on their level. You know, just uh, kind of off task. I mean, it's not giving up much, but it's something for us to do. <laughs> if you told us that once before, everybody likes a buried treasure. They do. <laughs> Why well, I started burying stuff. And, and they're doing real quick. They're they're time. also isolating. Obviously, they know he has a weird thing. Like his kill kit is his his little niche thing. Yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. emphasizing this. So they get and getting excited about it. Right. So they can get him to talk about it. Like more. oh wow, yeah, tell yeah, yeah, yeah wow yeah, this yeah. is a great idea. Like, like, in, in his yeah. in his fucking sociopath mind, wow they lay like this. They like this. They he's, like getting this. Fucking, he's getting bricked up underneath the I fucking know. table. They like this. Right there, and I figure, well, if they can't find it, I might as well create it. <laughs> <laughs> what about outside of Anchorage? Do you have other do you have stuff like this outside of Anchorage anywhere else in Alaska? Oh, give us something to do. <laughs> you guys have lots. To do. <laughs> yeah. True, but this would get this to get is out. a more fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to get out in the out in the woods. So. The weather's so nice up here. We like to spend time outside. Yeah, it is. And we should all take a field trip. <laughs> that was the fakest lab ever, too. So no, I, I, stuff like that, I normally don't. I, I only left that stuff there because I was planning on using it eventually. I just, uh, you just wanted to clean that? Yeah. <laughs> An environmental thing? Yeah. Does that mean she don't want to give up the bucket in Texas? <laughs> No. See how they just throw in like another? close to where it's at, would you? There's not a tracking device on it. No. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you need that. You're able to... Uh, no, I have a pretty good memory. I can play a pretty good cash flow. Now, at this point, you know, you heard him bring up Texas, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you, you're trying to see, like, uh, they're trying to connect different crimes and try to catch him, yeah. like, admit to something. But he's pretty slick. He, he he holds close, you know. He holds his uh, cards close to him. You know what I mean? And uh, I, don't know, I, I just find it interesting. Places I have a good memory when I need to. <laughs> if we came close to where one was, would you tell us? I don't. I don't know what you mean. Like if we were able to tell you an area area that we're pretty sure there's one in, would you tell us? Well, I assume you know. I've been kind of all over the place, and I do go places. I don't know what you consider close, like state, county. No, no, no. I mean, just deducting where things, especially just in Texas, because we have a little more information on specifically where you were at in Texas so through cell phone towers and those kind of things. Like when you left to Dallas to drive to Houston after the bank in SL, you didn't drive 45 straight to Houston. And you had to do something with that money from the Zell, because when you came back, had the money with you, so you picked it up down there. Didn't have it in your suitcase and get all moldy and wet. 
Oh, that's, that was just the small bills. So the 20s are still in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> On that route. The from small bills are a nuisance. <laughs> People nervous when you pull out a huge lot of small bills. And you didn't leave it in the Dallas area because you weren't planning on going back there. You knew your They're not giving up. going down to Wells. <laughs> no, the money was moldy because it wasn't. I didn't even know if I was going to go back to get it. I just I just buried it and figured, now if I make it back, I'll get it. If I don't, it's only a few hundred bucks, I think. So, so you don't, you've only got a buried treasure of a few hundred bucks that somebody might find there. <laughs> what? In Texas? Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm saying the money that was it was buried right by the airport. Because I didn't it's interesting what he doesn't want to give TSA up. TSA finding yeah. money. Carrying. Like, why is that? You already, you already no, just admitted to multiple bodies. Right. Why? Why are you so? It's the. Tra it's the. It's weird. What is? What, I, I want to know the obsession with treasure, buried treasure. What happened to him as a child? Where this was like. Because There's some sort of child tra trauma here. Something. I don't know. There's something, there's some weird childhood yeah. trauma thing going on right here. I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm not a well, I mean, therapist. But. I mean, they grew up with some pretty fucking wild fucking societal. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's true. Fucking Mormons living off the grid. That's how they got their Christmas presents. Becoming white supremacists. Wait, no, did Mormons celebrate Christmas? No, no. right? No. No, they don't celebrate any holidays, I think. Mm, no, maybe Mormon Day. Or am I, I thinking? I might, be, I might be thinking uh, of Jehovah. Oh, Jeho Jehovah's don't help. They don't celebrate oh, Earth Days. Yeah, 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 none yeah, of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't. But I don't. I'm, and they also give like seventy five percent of their check to the fucking church. Hell, dude, Mormons are the same way. You want to yeah. fucking science, don't get me started about Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one trip out east in two thousand nine was believed to be a very busy trip for uh, Keys. Uh, it all started with the disappearance of a woman by the name of Deborah Feldman, who was last seen alive on April eighth, two thousand nine, in Hackensack, New Jersey. Deborah was a known prostitute and drug addict, and Keys, who had admitted to frequenting prostitutes and was also speculated as having on-again, off-again issues with drugs and alcohol, was reportedly in the area during the time of her disappearance. Keys denied having any connection to Deborah Feldman, but a search of his home computer showed that Keys had searched her name numerous times. Bum, bum, Do bum. During, <laughs> during an interview, Keys was shown a series of pictures of people who had disappeared. As the pictures passed by, one by one, Keys kept saying, nope, 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 nope. Uh, once he was shown a picture of Deborah Feldman, however, Keys became withdrawn and refused to discuss it any further, saying, I'm not ready to talk about that one yet. Mm -hmm. So, it's believed that Keys took the body of Deborah Feldman into the state of New York and traveled upstate to an area called Tupper Lake, where he buried her body in an undisclosed location. It was here that Keys robbed the community bank of Tupper Lake. Did you ever get close to being caught doing any of those? Any arsons or any bank robbery? I think so. Which, uh, arson or bank robbery? Or? Bank robbery. I think I got pretty close. It makes you think that. Actually, it was it was that one that, that you guys know about now, that one in New York, uh, Tupper Lake. Yeah. There was, uh, I was leaving. And there was a car that passed me, and I knew it was a detective or somebody because they had a they had a visor light or something, um, some kind of light. I knew it was a cop of some kind anyway, and uh, it wasn't like an official patrol car, but I think I think there were a couple people in it, and uh, it was windy roads going through the mountains and stuff, and kind of on a hunch, I was I was thinking, well. Because this was quite a while after the robbery, I was quite a ways from the scene. I was thinking, well, just just in case they, in case they have a vehicle description or something, I better pull off the road. And there was a campground, and I pulled off really quick and kind of, kind of backed into some trees and uh, and just sat there for a while and was counting money. And I think I saw uh, the same car go back the other way, like it might have been looking for me. So. I don't know if they were, I don't even know if it was the same car. It went by really fast, but it looked like it could have been the same car. Like fast, like it was trying to catch up to you? Yeah. I don't know for sure if they were, but all the same, I think I sat there for quite a while, sat there for several hours, and figured by then everybody who was going to be at the scene was going to be there. Like, I remember reading about it a few days later. They, 
that one really freaked him out because it was such a small town. And they like locked all the schools and everything. We had SWAT teams patrolling the streets or whatever. And, but I, yeah, that was what I was thinking at the time. I was like, I'm just gonna hang out at this campground and count money and stuff. And when he stops by, I'll just act like I'm fishing. And did you have a fishing pole? I think I did on that trip. I don't think I had a license though. So it was also on this trip that he buried one of his kill kits between the town of Tupper Lake, New York, and Essex, Vermont. Essex. Be- beautiful, beautiful town, by the way. Essex? Well, it's not going to be beautiful here in a minute, Garrett. <laughs> beautiful town. <laughs> so from 2009 to 2011, Keyes made numerous trips throughout the country, from California to Nevada to Florida to Maine. On June 2nd, 2011, Keyes flew, flew from Anchorage, Alaska to Chicago, Illinois, and picked up a rental car, which is common on his trips as he rarely flew directly to his destination. After picking up his it's rental, kind of sightsee. Yeah, yeah, you got to yeah, check out the sights. Uh, after, after picking up his rental car, Keys, his whereabouts are unaccounted for for 14 hours. The amount of time it took him to get his rental car and arrive at his mother's house the following day. So, huge gap of time, and we'll discuss where Keys could have possibly been during this time later in the episode. By the afternoon of June 3rd, he is in Indiana visiting his mother. And after leaving his mother's house, Keyes traveled east en route to visit his family in Maine. He made a detour to pick up the kill kit uh, that he placed in New York during his 2009 visit, just outside the border with Vermont, and then made a stop at a hotel in Essex, Vermont. For Bill and Lorraine Courier, Israel's visit to their community will turn to tragedy. Now we'll let Keyes tell the rest of this story doing a lot of driving around and I was looking for churches, houses, and um, I was in the motel that I had stayed at a couple other times, I think, and um, and I was also in that area because I wanted to dig up those guns that I had buried there. They had been there for a few years and I wanted to check on them, make sure they were they weren't full of water, and uh, so I don't really, I think what, ha- I think the way it worked is I went fishing for a day, then I went down and found the guns, um, brought them back up to the motel room and, you know, worked on them for a while, getting everything working again. And um, then I found that house and it was exactly what I was looking for and um, started to think that I would do, you know, like I would go all out and just do a bunch of stuff like if I, I was kind of thinking if I'm gonna do something here I'm gonna go all out and do a bunch of stuff so the plan was I I was in the hotel that evening the evening before they were reported missing or whatever um, I had all of the guns ready to go and I had on actually I think it was that same jacket that you found me with that rain jacket and I started walking around town at about eight or nine o'clock after it had got dark and um, I was looking for someone to carjack because I already had so I had my backpack with me it had a bunch of stuff in it like cable ties and duct tape and some stuff for like blindfolds or something and um, went across the went across the road from the hotel and had a apartment complex there staked out and I was waiting for someone to come in alone and I was also looking for a someone who was coming in in a decent car that was um, fairly generic because my thought was the next day after I got done with whoever I took I was going to take their car and I had three banks staked out in different towns starting Quite a ways north of Burlington, there's, I think, Highway 15 went up north and did like a loop, and there were several towns along that route. And so starting up north, I had a bank staked out at the top of the loop. There's, I forget the name of the town. And then there were two more towns in a row right on the way back to Burlington. Both had small banks in them. My plan was to take whoever's car I took up to the furthest north one, and hit that and then drive back down Route 15 and hit the other two banks on my way back to Burlington and then dump the car in Burlington 
and um, just move everything into my car and check out of the hotel and, and leave that day. So, <clears throat> so that's what I was. I was uh, had this apartment staked out. I was actually looking for a guy, and there was uh, it was pouring rain, big lightning storm, and um, there was a guy who came in. He was in a, a yellow V Dub Bug, newer one, and. Um, and he's almost he 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 almost got it that night. If if he hadn't got out of the car, he'd been about five seconds slower getting out of his car, going into the apartment. He would have he would have been the one that night. But um, like I said, it was raining, so I walked out of this little wooded area and I was walking up behind his car, and he kind of or walking along the line of cars towards his car, and he kind of jumped out. He had like a newspaper over his head, and he ran into the apartment keep from getting wet but yeah he was that would have been my first choice I guess but I wasn't I was waiting for the right opportunity so when that didn't work out I wasn't that worried about it I just waited till later I was just walking around and I think I went back to the hotel for a little while to wait till after midnight there was nobody out that night because it was still raining off and on and um I went out, uh, when the carjacking thing didn't work out, I decided I was going to look for a house with a couple in it, you know, with a car, a decent car. So I was started walking through neighborhoods back behind the hotel, and I was looking for a house that didn't look like it had a dog. I was looking for a single car garage with no cars parked outside. And I was looking for a fairly easy way to get into the garage. And theirs was the first house I found that had all those things. Once I got into the garage, the car was unlocked and I looked in, the, checked out the registration. I think I found out that it was registered to a woman and I think there was something else in the car that had her birth date on it. So I knew about the age of the couple that was there. Did that matter? Yeah, I mean, I was also looking for... I didn't want to go into a house where there were kids. So I was checking for those things in the garage, like anything related to kids, and I checked the back seat of their car to make sure there wasn't dog hair and stuff in it. Yeah, once I found out that it was the right house, and I knew that they were home because I could... Uh, I had walked around the house, and they had a... I could hear some fans running in the bedroom, so I, I knew what bedroom they were sleeping in. And uh, they had their house was locked up really tight. It was there was no way into the house. I got um, like even the the garage door, the door between the house and the garage had a deadbolt. I was able to get the outer door. It had like a screen door. I was able to jimmy the lock on that one, but the the door behind it had a deadbolt. So I knew I was going to have to break the window to get into the house, but. I wasn't really worried about that because it was inside the garage. I didn't think anybody would hear. Was there a window between the garage and the house? Or no. No, it was just uh, the window and the door. To the garage? Right. The the man door was like between the, the house and the garage. But it, yeah, the, the garage, other than, other than the window, they had left a window open in the garage. There was one window on the side of the house that had a fan in it. And I, uh, I grabbed one of their chairs in the backyard and took the fan out of the window and I just crawled through the window. And then once I got into the garage and decided that it was the right house, I, um, the garage had a back door on it too, to the backyard. And I undid, unlocked the deadbolt on that, kind of staked up, checked out the neighborhood, made sure every, I mean, was checking out all the other houses around there, make sure that there was, uh, wasn't anybody up and the house right next door from the street, it would have been the house on the left. They had a dog that they kept letting out. It was like a big golden retriever or something. And it kept uh, barking. And there was a guy who kept coming out and smoking cigarettes. So I just kept waiting. I just kept uh, hanging out around their house. And and then uh, once it seemed like the that house and or that guy had I don't remember if he left or if he went to bed or what. Like he wasn't coming out of the house anymore. And it seems like they had locked their dog back inside. I uh, went back into the garage, 
by then I think it was probably one or two. After I found that house and decided that it was probably that it was probably just a couple, I think I even had it pegged down just from looking at the outside that it was probably an older couple just because of the way they had their backyard set up. They had like a swimming pool and a deck and a barbecue and it just looked like a you know, like older couple that didn't have kids kind of house. So I knew there was probably only one room in the house that was being used as the bedroom. And uh, I was pretty sure I'd found it just from walking around the house. Oh, that room? Yeah, because I heard, uh, even though the blinds were closed, I heard fans running in it, and it was hot that night. It was really hot and muggy, and it had been raining. And So I, I already knew, I like in my head, before I even went into the garage, I already had in my head about what the layout of the house was. It was just a ranch house, so it wasn't hard to figure out. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, I knew that they, you know, you always think of that. <laughs> like to, and they did, they had a gun right there in the nightstand. But Which gun was in the nightstand? That, the one I took. So they had to sit right on top of the nightstand? It was, no, it was in a drawer in oh, the nightstand. Okay. But it wasn't loaded. <laughs> it wouldn't have done them much good. No, there was no, it wouldn't have mattered. Cause I like once I was actually in the house, I was in, probably in the bedroom within five or six seconds from the time the glass broke. So, where did you break the glass at? The door, the kitchen door between the garage and the kitchen. Were they still asleep when you got to there? Or do you think they heard that? They heard it, but they were just barely. I mean, they, they were just wondering what it was. Up. Yeah. So you didn't take, you don't do anything or to prevent them from calling or anything like that or using the phone or anything like that? Well, I cut the phone lines outside the house. Oh, okay. okay. I cut the phone lines as soon as I picked the house because usually if there's an alarm system, it'll trigger the alarm. Oh, I see. So you could watch and see if Right. So I, I so cut the phone while. lines and I, and like I said, the neighbor next door, he was still up. He kept coming out and smoking, so I knew I wasn't going to break in until... Or no, I broke in. I broke into the garage, but I knew I wasn't going to break into the house until I was sure that the neighbors were asleep. So, so I was in the garage, and I unlocked the back door of the garage so I could come and go. And then I found the phone box on the side of the house, and I uh, had my side cutters with me, and I cut the wire, the main wire of the phone box, and figured if they had any kind of alarm or something, the police would do a drive-by or something. So after I cut that, I was outside for probably an hour or two, just kind of hanging out, out in, mostly in the backyard behind the swimming pool, waiting for everybody in the neighborhood to go to sleep, and uh, and also watching for watching the street for cops or cars driving by, but there was never anything. So. so what happened after you entered the house? I know you said you went right back to the bedroom. It took five, six seconds. What what happened then? Oh, I just I don't know, told them right away what was going on. Were they cooperative at first, at least, both of them? Yeah. yeah. Pretty shocked. <laughs> I'm sure. People never expect <laughs> stuff to happen. <laughs> Do you remember what you told them? Um, I, well, I just, you know, it's like a blitz attack. You just uh, make sure they know right away who's in charge and uh, immediately tie them up tell them what the rules are, that there's no talking unless I talk to them. They don't move unless I tell them to move, and I did uh, their hands behind their back and had them, you know, pulled everything off the bed and got their hands and their feet together with cable ties, and then just started talking to them, like asking them one question after the other, and then I would ask them, like, the same questions over to see, you know, like if they were lying. Yeah. I remember the first thing I asked them was if they had an alarm or if, and if they and if they had a safe. And I was pretty sure they hadn't lied about that stuff, but you know, then I asked them again a few minutes later, and, uh, and then I'd ask them, you know, ask them like where the guns are, where the jewelry is, where the cash is, where the cell phones are, where their ATM cards are. So um, they, they, you don't have to tell them, but they they know they're being robbed. That's what they. That's what they think is happening. They're being robbed. Well, they kept trying to ask me. I didn't tell them what was happening. They kept trying to, trying to ask me what was going on. And, you know, I didn't. I never answered. Them. You know, it's just stuff to keep telling them to shut up and and listen to me. And eventually, they, you know, they just they're just uh, quiet. And you know, then I kind of 
when I was going through the house, checking out the house and checking where everything was and getting everything loaded into suitcases and stuff, they, um, I keep peeking back in the bedroom. I had my headlamp on, but I would look back in the bedroom every once in a while to make sure that they weren't trying anything. And uh, seems like at one time she started trying to roll over or something, and I think I had, uh, I think I grabbed her, or grabbed her by the neck, or just to, yeah, I, <laughs> that's what it was, because they weren't taking me very, they they weren't taking the situation seriously enough, I guess, and uh, and that was a problem throughout the night that um, that I was having, so. Which, yeah, it surprised me. I, uh, that they didn't take you seriously? Yeah, that they didn't take me seriously. I, Why do you think that was? Well, I, I don't know. 2020 hindsight is probably because they didn't even know that I had a gun. I told them I had a gun, but they could never, they never saw me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like any time I was in the room, there were never any lights on. And so... Just your headlamp. Right. So, I mean, if you look at someone with a headlamp on, you can't tell what they have in their hands. Plus they, yeah, they were, I think they were just kind of in awe that it was happening, like they couldn't believe it, and they kept, you know, like wanting an explanation as to why it was happening, so. But yeah, she, she tried, it seemed like, yeah, she tried to roll over, she, she was, yeah, she was talking to him, she was, like, they were, I could tell they were trying to make a plan and figure out what to do, and I, I like, jumped up over on the bed and grabbed her by the neck and shoved her head down into the pillow, and just told her I was, even when they didn't think I was watching, I might be watching, and no matter what they tried to do or what they said, it wasn't gonna, it was only gonna piss me off. It wasn't gonna change anything for them. So, so after that, they uh, they stayed quiet for quite a while and didn't didn't do anything. And then the next time I had started having trouble with them was uh, when I got them in the car. So you were only in their house about 15 minutes, drove straight to the, um, the yeah. house out there in the, in, in the country. And yeah, I think you said that uh, getting them in the vehicle uh, was interesting or difficult. There was some difficulty. Yeah, they, well, that's when they started. That was the first time they got a look at me and because the dome light came on, I guess, and they were, you know, they were both checking me out, <laughs> like trying to figure out so what I was going on. I, I mean, I had a mask on, but um, I had a mask in my, the hood of my jacket on. But they would, uh, they were, you know, they started trying to talk to me and stuff, and try to personalize it. Yeah, yeah. And I was, I mean, I would, I, I would go along with it a little bit because it seemed like it was, like the guy he was he used to be in the same unit in the army that I was in, in this 25th Infantry Division or something. Okay. Yeah, I found I found one of his insignia patches when I was going through their dresser, and I was asking him about it. Anyway, yeah, I was just I was just bullshitting them, and they were, um, you know, they of course wanted to know what, why why I was we were leaving in the car. What'd you tell them? No, I just told them it was a it was a kidnap for ransom set up, and that there were other people involved in it. So. Did you take the? the uh, laundry clothing and stuff to make it look like maybe they had gone on a trip? Was that part of the reason? Well, I was thinking that might... I, I wasn't really thinking... I, I was, that was part of my thinking, but I, I wasn't doing it for that reason, really, because uh, I knew that with the broken window and the cut phone lines, the police would know that it was yeah. pretty unlikely that someone would do that, make it look like they got kidnapped and disappeared. <laughs> So I, the main reason I took the suitcases was because uh, I only had a small backpack with me and I wanted to keep all of their stuff separate from my stuff. I had a lot of stuff in the backpack that I had with me. So I, yeah, everything I kept, I took from their house, I wanted to keep separate so I could go through it later. And What kind of stuff do you have in your backpack? <laughs> I don't know if I want to go into all that today. So we pretty much went through, you know, I think what happened at the house. Right. And then getting the car and then to the, the house on Route 15. Yeah, there was one thing. Uh, I don't, they probably won't find anything on it, but there was a crowbar that was hanging in their garage. That's what I used to break the, the window on the door to the kitchen. It was a, like a 24 inch crowbar and uh, it was hanging on a pegboard at the back of the garage. And uh, after I broke the window, I uh, think I just dropped it on the floor. And then when we were leaving, I 
picked up the crowbar and hung it back on the pegboard once I had him in the car. I had her in the front seat and uh, her hands were behind her back. I had cable ties on them and I think I had cable ties on her feet too. And once I had her in, once I had him in there, and he was uh, he was kind of overweight and he wasn't in very good health, so I wasn't that worried about him. But I had his hands uh, cable tied, and then I had a seatbelt on him too. And um, he was he in the back? Yeah, he was in the back on the passenger side. Like I say, they were wondering what was going on. So I I don't know. I I guess I just I just told them a story that I thought was somewhat believable, so they wouldn't freak out on the way out there. Told them they were t- I was taking them to a to a drop house, and there were other people that were going to meet us there, and uh, they were convinced that I had their own people. You know that they didn't. I think they thought it was a case of mistaken identity or something. They thought that they were because I was asking them about uh, drugs too when I was in the house. I took all their prescri- prescription. There was like some Percocets and Vicodin and stuff like that, but there weren't there weren't any illegal drugs that I found and. So I had all that stuff in, in the suitcase, so I think they thought that it was related to something to that, and uh, so we were driving out to the house, and and she started talking about, um, you know, I should, I should start screaming, or I should start doing something, and I told her, I said, you're just going to piss me off because there's nobody around to help you. It was like, it was probably about 1 or 2 a.m. at that time, and then I had, I already had my backpack with me, it had, uh, had a bunch of stuff in it. I had uh, like a propane burner, camp stove thing, and a pan for boiling water. Had a few like water bottles, Perry bottles that had uh, water in them, and had a coil, like a 50 foot coil of uh, nylon rope, duct tape, uh, latex gloves. I guess you'd call it a rape kit. That's what it mostly was, and uh, so I had all that stuff in the bag with me. After I had him in the car, I drove to the hotel where my car was parked. My car was parked off to the side, kind of in a dark area of the parking lot, and I backed their car in right alongside my car. And I hadn't decided for sure at that point what to do with their bodies, so I threw a bunch of stuff out of my car into into their car trunk. I had a shovel, had uh, some diesel, I had uh, a big roll of the 55 gallon trash bags, and the Drano, I threw that in their trunk, and uh, started driving out to the house. There wasn't, it was really late, there wasn't anybody on the roads or anything. Got out to the house, and I parked back behind the house there, and she was in the front seat, and I thought I had her pretty secure. Yeah, at that point I thought I wasn't really that worried about it. I think I even had the seat belt cable tied together so that she couldn't just pop the buckle and get out. My plan was to take him into the basement, tie him up separate, and then take her upstairs. There were these two queen-size mattresses in the upstairs corner bedroom. And that's where I planned to take her, and then him I was gonna leave downstairs uh, for a while. But anyway, I took him down through the outside basement access, and I walked him down there, found a, it was like an old stool, cable tied his hands down to the stool so he couldn't stand up, and then I had the stool backed up against the wall, and thought I had it pretty well secured, and... uh, (laughs) Well, I, I, I mean, it must have taken me longer than I thought because I came out of the basement and she was standing right there by the door. She had got out of the car, or she was in the process of, like, she she just had thongs on, on her feet, and she was she had somehow broke the cable ties on her hands and on her feet and got out of the car. She was almost to the road when I came out of the basement, and she saw me come out, and she started running, and I tackled her on the lawn and uh, <laughs> roughed her up a little bit and tied her back up and took her upstairs. Had her uh, lay down on the, I had the mattresses. I think I had already had them set up from the day before when I had the house. I had them thrown down in the middle of the, of the room upstairs. 
had her lie down on the mattresses. I gave up on the cable ties. I don't know, it must have been a bad batch or something. They kept breaking, and, uh, and so I didn't trust them anymore, so I took uh, duct tape and made handcuffs out of that and with her hands behind her back. And then once I had her laying down on the bed, I took uh, the nylon rope and ran it under between the mattresses, under the one she was on and on top of the other one, and then uh, did a trucker's hitch and cinched her down to the mattress then cut off the rope that was left over. She was, she was feisty. She was like fighting the whole time. And uh, so I just kept tightening the rope on the bed. I had it set up so that it was just uh, like a loop. You pull the loop and then tighten the hitch. And I just kept tightening it. And I finally told her like, if you keep struggling, I'm just gonna keep tightening it until you pass out. Cause I think I had it around her neck. After that, she stopped. And uh, I had in my bag, I had some cuffs that I had made out of nylon, one inch nylon webbing. I put those on her feet, on her ankles, and they had a loop on them. And I took the rope. There was uh, the door to the bedroom was taken off the hinges. The hinge was still there on the door frame. And it had a pin in it. And I took uh, one section of rope, tied it to to the cuff on her left foot and uh, ran it around the pin on that hinge and did another trucker's hitch. And then there was nothing to tie the other one to on the other side of the room. So I ran downstairs and uh, there was like a tool room off the back of the house and there was found a section of pipe about 20 inches long and uh, found some big nails like four inch 20 penny nails. and. Took that upstairs and she was already struggling again trying to get off the bed, but she hadn't, she hadn't actually got off yet. And, uh, and I took the nail and drove it into the window facing, the side of the window facing the road there. Did another trucker's hitch on that side. Just kept tightening both of them until her legs were like spread eagle and she couldn't move at all really. And uh, then I heard, uh, I heard some movement downstairs because at that point she was she finally shut up a little bit, and uh, and that's when I started having problems with the guy. I went down there, and he had the stool. He was he was kind of a big guy, like overweight, and the stool had just collapsed. And I guess when it collapsed, the cable ties that I had on his wrist behind his back they had broke, and the stool like, came apart. I don't know, just messed my whole plan up. So I was kind of pissed off about that, and uh, I was like yelling at him, like, "Why, why are you trying to get away? You're just..." making it worse and and at that point he was still like trying to talk me out of it it's like just let us go I know you're in too deep but we haven't really seen you you can still walk away <laughs> and I, I just kind of laughed at him I was like I can't, you know I, like, I don't know if I actually said anything but in my head I was like you don't even know what how much planning I've put into this and just walk away <laughs> I mean at that point I could say he had just reached a point where he wasn't gonna cooperate no matter what and uh, I didn't have the Ruger 1022 on me I had it it was upstairs in the backpack I had my 40 cal and I had a knife and I didn't want to use the knife on him so I'm like I'm make a big mess and uh, so I think I, I just kind of grabbed him by the neck and pushed him up against one of the posts and put the knife to him and he still like he had his hands out but he still wasn't doing what I said and uh, and then I got started getting pissed and I just told him, I was like, I have, I have a gun upstairs. And if you want to do this the hard way or do it the easy way, it's up to you. He didn't really believe me or take me seriously or whatever. So there was a, there was a shovel in the basement and I hit him with that a couple times and he, and he was still trying to wrestle with me and stuff. And I just came to the realization that, you know, he wasn't going to stop fighting. And, uh, and so I knew I was either going to have to knock him out or just kill him. Uh, but by then I already had her all set up upstairs and it was, you know, it's like, it was annoying me that I was having to deal with him. And so I went back upstairs, I, I like ran back upstairs and uh, by then I was all amped up and grabbed my, uh, grabbed the 1022 out of the backpack. I didn't want to shoot him with the 40 cal because there was a car, there was a cop car right across the road. I don't know if it was the sheriff's house or if his car was just there. 
parked in the driveway or something? Yeah, it was like only, there was a house probably only 100 yards away, and I, the 40 cal was loud, and I was paranoid about using it, so. So I grabbed that, and I grabbed the silencer and put that on, and I was only, I was upstairs for maybe 20 or 30 seconds, and she was still on the bed. She couldn't move anywhere at that time, but she could tell that things were not going well. I think I was cursing and stuff, and like he kept yelling up above, at the after the up after me up the stairs. He was like, "Where's my wife? What's going on?" And and I was like, "I, I told you, you're not going to cooperate. You can do it the hard way." And uh, and I uh, came back downstairs, and he was standing at the bottom of the stairs in the basement. Still, it was like he he didn't have any light, but I could tell when I came down the stairs, like he was uh, he was trying to figure out some way to fight me. He was like feeling around for something to hit me with and I came back down the stairs and I saw that I said oh you're still not going to cooperate and I uh, I had the gun out in front of me like pointed from the hip and uh, had my headlamp on he saw the gun and he started to say something and it just pissed me off and I just started pulling the trigger he threw his arms up kind of crossed them in front of him it seems like and I actually saw, like in my headlamp, I actually saw the bullets hitting him. But it wasn't loud, it was, you couldn't even really, I mean, if someone heard that gun, even if they were in the next room, they probably wouldn't even know it was a gun. I just kept pulling the trigger. I pulled as fast as I could until the magazine was empty. Yeah, he didn't, he, he, he was still standing when the last shot hit him. But I was mostly, I was pissed off after I had to shoot him, because I knew, <laughs> I was really proud of that gun. I was like, no, I have to throw the barrel away. So I was pissed off about that, but anyway, um, yeah, so after he went down, I checked him out for a couple minutes, I just kind of watched him. He had his eyes closed, so I don't think he was dead, but I, I, I waited long enough to make sure that he wasn't going to get back up or go anywhere, and then I went back upstairs and, and took the gun apart, and I don't think she knew that, um, or I didn't take it apart, I just took the silencer off. I don't think she knew that I had shot him, but um, she knew that something had happened. And after that, she, at first she didn't, uh, you know, try anything much, but uh, then once she realized that I was gonna rape her, then she started uh, started fighting again and stuff, so. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm gonna go into details of that part, but I came really close to getting away from <laughs> She was, she was almost to the road, and she, when I found she got out of the car, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that, I almost, after that, I almost wasn't going to use cable ties again because I didn't trust them. She was like, I think she was 50-something, and she was a lot stronger than she looked. I don't think I've ever broke one of those cable ties. <laughs> but, um, yeah, after that, I think when I raped her the second time, I was worried about her screaming, so I had, uh, I made a gag, took a bunch of paper towels and some duct tape, put them in her mouth, and uh, wrapped duct tape around her mouth. And after that, she was uh, she wasn't fighting anymore. I think she knew I think she knew what was going to happen, and uh, put all my uh, anything that had touched her, like the cuffs and everything else. I I didn't want to throw them away, but I just decided I better. So I threw all that stuff. I had one of those big bags, and I just after I had, had her tied up, I had cut off all of her clothes with that knife, and I put all her you know everything that had been on her and put in that bag and then uh, grabbed the bag walked her down the stairs to the, all the way to the basement she was sitting on a bench down there and she was kind of out of it by then she was uh, when I uh, second time I raped her I had uh, I choked her and she passed out for a little while so she was yeah, like by the time I walked her downstairs, she was a little bit out of it. I don't know if she really knew what was going on at that point. I had my <clears throat> had my leather gloves on, and I think I took a piece of the rope and stood behind her while she was sitting on that bench and used it like a garret and strangled her. And I knew that she was I knew that she was gone. So I knew, I was pretty sure that she was gone, but then I was, I wanted to be sure she wasn't going to wake back up or start breathing again. So I took a cable tie and put it around her neck, tightened it down as much as I could, and then uh, left her on the 
floor. Interesting that he switches his, uh, going back to what I was saying, this is the scariest kind of serial killer, is no motive, no, like, now he switched his victim. Yep. Just a, mar- a random married couple. You know, he says that he has killed couples before, but, you know, he, he hasn't admitted, so there's no, like, proof that he did, so apparently this is, like, his first couple that yep. he murdered, you know what I mean? And Well, I mean, if you go back to Samantha, he was going to wait for the boyfriend. He was going to wait for the boyfriend, that is true, that is true. Also, I want to, like, kind of tie in the whole drug connection, because you'll see, like, a common theme, like, with, with this, because with uh, Samantha, she was a recovering on-again, off-again uh, cocaine addict. The family was involved with the drug trade. Uh, Deborah Feldman was a prostitute and known drug drug Trying addict. Um, Keys is a drug addict and alcoholic. And as he's kidnapping the, the couriers in the beginning, he's actually rummaging through their house looking for drugs. Mm. You know what I mean? So he's looking for a fix. All right. So the place... This also goes there. There's a little bit more research into his victims, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, he, he definitely, definitely had a... He explains that he definitely had a type that he was looking for on this trip you know he was looking for a house that had didn't have any kids had a, a single car uh you know so on and so forth basically looking for like a, a boomer a boomer house yeah you know? so now the place where keys took the couriers an abandoned farmhouse was so dilapidated and full of trash keys felt that he didn't need to put much thought into disposing of the bodies he wrapped both bill and lorraine in 50 gallon trash bags poured drano inside the uh, speed up their decomp and place their bodies in the corner of the basement so they would blend in with the rest of the refuse that was already in there. Uh, little did anyone know, other than Keys, apparently, uh, but the house was set for demolition and a short time after the murders, the farmhouse was leveled and hauled to the local landfill. Uh, one year later, after Keys' admission to the murder, the FBI were at the landfill trying to uh, find the, their remains. Sounds like a needle in a haystack. Yeah. I have no doubt that we're going to find the bodies because we've been very successful at narrowing it down to an area of the dump. And it's not tiny, um, but it's small enough to where we're going to be able to search it successfully. I have no doubt of that. Uh, But it's going to take time for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is some of the safety concerns and stuff like that. I mean, you can't just go in there and start throwing stuff around. You've got to wear special stuff because of all the human waste. Yeah, like I said, I really jumped the gun on that one. I had no idea. (laughs) Oh, man. What the hell? But like, so looking there. at that house, I knew there was like a 10% chance that the owner was either going to pay to have it demolished or just throw a match in it. It was that ragged that the house? Uh, well, I knew it. I just knew from what I know about houses, I knew it wasn't something anybody would try to remodel. Did it have a refurbish. for sale sign out in front of it? Was yeah. it for sale actively? Yeah. So apparently there wasn't too many people looking at that house to purchase it after you were there. No. I That's think, why I was curious. I, I'm not surprised, though, that whoever had it listed didn't take pictures of the inside because it was in pretty bad wasn't shape. wasn't impressive to No, it that. wasn't. It actually looks a lot better from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and so now that the people out there in Vermont are, are, are in the dump and they're looking for the your black uh, bags, <laughs> you know, so... Um, and I think you told us four bags. Are they separate bags, or you put a bag on the bottom and a bag on the top? Yeah, that's how it was. Separate bags, or a bag on the top, bag on... I mean, were they... Two bags on each body. Okay. That's yeah, that, that's what I thought you said. How, how did you secure them? I mean, did you, I don't think they were secured. Just I covered. may have knotted them on top, uh-huh. like knotted the two bags together. But okay. the main, I mean, I had main the main reason I had for putting uh, the bags on was just so that people wouldn't they would have to actually pull the pull bag off to see what it was in it, and uh, and also to hold the the drain on the bodies. I had some drain that I brought with me. So, so when they're looking for these, if there's any, if the, it, was there dis, did you dismember them? So no. they're looking, so they're, they're, they're intact. So if we find partial, we need to keep looking to find them. Yeah, there should, they're, um, yeah, if they, if, I'm guessing, it sounds like they brought in a big excavator or something. I'm still surprised. Sounds like a really big one. Yeah, it would have had to have been a really big one because, uh, because like I say, the, bar, the bags weren't tied together, so. Seems like it would have been the bodies would have. Although it's only it's been less than a year, so the bodies probably weren't even. You know, they were probably only about halfway to skeletal. So they're you probably think even with all the moisture, the bags will trap and stuff. Well, it depends how busy the bugs got, but. Um, and what, and what you put the Drano in there? Is that what you said? Drano. Yeah. What's that for? 
Uh, the Drano was an idea I had uh, in case they were found right away. I didn't want um, there to be any DNA on the outside of the bodies. Oh, does that? I had heard that um, the lie in the Drano destroys, like, scrambles up all the DNA. I don't know. Hmm. And also, it was, I was thinking to keep it like, uh, you know, if you leave it on sock, like, if you leave the Drano I was using, I had used it before, and I noticed that they got splashed on me, and it'll actually burn through your skin if you leave it on there long enough. And uh, so that was the other thought I had that it would start the, the decomposition, and they would, you know, break them down a little bit faster, keep them from bloating and stuff. <laughs> Criminal AF would be back after this quick break. Now back to Criminal AF. Uh, so along with Samantha Koenig, the couriers are Israel's only confirmed murders, uh, with Deborah Feldman being as close to confirmed without actually being confirmed, if that makes sense. There are many others that Keyes may be guilty of, as Keyes himself admitted... Oh, dude, he's... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's admitted to at least uh, seven or eight more in addition to Koenig Double and the that. Couriers. I guarantee you oh, yeah, double yeah, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's weird that... Like, I, yeah, I know you'll never understand the true psyche of them. Like, why you'll have one person who will just admit to everything. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people that hold on to those kills and want to keep it... Some, you can keep a little bit for yourself. Yeah, Absolutely. Now, the reason authorities believe, tend to believe uh, that Keyes' uh, estimation of victims is, is true is because there was a drawing that was found in his uh, jail cell, which he drew with his own blood, depicting 11 skulls with a small note that stated, we are one. So take that how you will. Yeah, right? but that could also be him trying to set up the story, like keep, to keep the story. Right. Like, there's, oh, yeah. yeah. Because that's pretty deliberate to paint that in blood and then leave it in your cell. Like, yeah. Now it seems very uh, planned, right? And if we, you know, go back to when he was discussing, you know, like around the time I was fourteen. By the time I was fourteen, you know, he stresses like the age of fourteen, and that's basically saying uh, that he became a, a serial killer at the age of fourteen. Yeah. And now he's in his thirties. Yeah. That that was the, so, the the brain switch right there. Yeah. So yeah, eleven and plus all that travel. That he's oh, been yeah. doing? No, there's, there's got to be more. But, so we may never know the true extent of Israel's vicious crimes because on December 2nd, 2012, Keyes was found dead inside his cell. He slit his wrists with the blade from a disposable shaving razor and also choked himself with a sheet. Pussy. Pussy. Pussy, pussy, pussy. Honestly, we need to get... Oh, like, you know how they have the... Oh, like the, the staples? The staples. Uh, that was easy. We need a pussy <laughs> yeah. for every time one of these fucking losers kills themselves. We need yeah. a, so we can just hit it. Yeah. <laughs> or be like, he slid his wrist with the razor blade. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> pussy. Pussy, pussy, pussy. So he did leave, leave behind a suicide note, Garrett. Oh, he did. I, yep. I do remember. And it did not bring any closure to any of the al remaining alleged victims. But it does make for a great poetry slam at the open mic night. You want to hear it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Right. Oh wait, are you gonna recite it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a poetry slam. All right, awesome, awesome. Okay. Cool, cool. We gotta set the, we gotta set the mood. Get it, Dave. We gotta set the mood here. All right. Yeah. Global overuse. <laughs> There's no way. You You're reading a suicide note in a book. <laughs> Where will you go? You clever yes. little worm. If you bleed, your host dry. Back in your ride, the night is still young. Street lights push back the black and neat rows. <laughs> Off to the right, a graveyard appears. Lines of stones, bodies molder below. Take away quick, bob your head to the seat. Woo! And straight through that stop sign you roll. Breeze, brother. Loaded truck with lights off slams into you broadside. Your flesh smashed as metal explodes. You may have been free. You love living your life. Fate as its own scheme crushed like a bug. You still die. Ooh. 
Soon now, you'll join those ranks of dead as your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears, pretend it's off to heaven you go. Oh, but the reality is you're just bones and meat with your brain died also your soul. He's getting dark. That's He's getting deep. Dark. That's He's deep. Getting That's deep. deep. He's getting dark. But the reality is you're just bones and oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong part. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of retirement homes. Quietly, quickly say it's for the best. It's best for you, so their fate you'll not know. Ooh, this guy's spitting. Turn a blind eye back to the screen. Soak in your reality shows. Stand in front of your mirror and you preen in a plastic castle you call home. Oh, conformists. Mm. Conformists. Fucking modern consumers. That's right. A little Unabomber action there. Land of the free. Land of the lie. Land of scheme. American eyes. Consume what you don't need. Stars you idolize. Wait, that was a bar. Land of scheme. <laughs> American eyes? Yeah. Right, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Consume what you need, stars you idolize, pursue what you admit as a dream, then it's American die. Get in your big car. Get in your big car so you can work fast on roads made of dinosaur bones. Punch in on the clock and sit on your ass playing stupid ass games on your phone. Oh, Candy Crush, Candy Crush. Candy Crush. <laughs> Farm, Farmville. <laughs> Paper on your own. It was 2012. It's Farmville. Oh, no. Candy Crush was around. Oh, is it? Yeah. All right. All right. Candy Crush. Candy Crush. Candy Paper on your wall says you got smarts. That test you took told you so. But would you still crawl like the vermin you are once your precious power grid's blown? Ooh. Definitely Unibobber esque. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of the scheme, American eyes. Now that I have held you tight, I will tell you a story. Speak soft in your ears so you know that it's true. You were my love at first sight and thought you were scared to be near me. My words penetrize... Penetrize. <laughs> my words penetrize... I said it again. Your words penetrate... <laughs> Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. Your words penetrate your thoughts. Now in an intimate prelude. I look in your eyes. They were so dark, warm, and trusting. I had to tape them up. <laughs> I had a fishing line through them. As you thought you had not a worry or care, the more guileless the gaze, the better potential to fill up those pools with your fear. Deep, deep, deep. Your fame, your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight it will turn plastered back to the sweat of your blood. Your wet lips were a promise of secrets unspoken. Nervous laugh as it burst like a pulse of blood through your throat. There will be no more laughter here. Your, I feel your body tense up. My hand on your shoulder. Your eyes. Forget the lady called luck. She does not abide near me. For her powers don't extend to those who are dead. Your precious pet. What that I could keep you. Let you be the master of your own fate. Knowing full well what's at stake. My pretty captive butterfly, colorful wings, my hand smears. I somewhat, I somehow repaint them with unpunishment and tears. Oh. Violet metamorphosis emerged from dark moth princess. I would come often. What the fuck are we talking about? Skeet, skeet. What are we talking about, I Israel? I would come <laughs> often and worship at the altar of your flesh. Oh, see. You shudder with revulsion and try to shrink far from me. How long does this fucking thing go? I have tied you down <laughs> and begging to become Just my Just fucking kill yourself. Sweetie. You fucking loser. I know, fucking ended already. <laughs> okay, talk is over. Words are plastic and weak. Back it with action, or it all comes off cheap. Yeah. Walk close while I work now. Yeah. Feel the electric shock of my touch. Ooh. Open my trembling flower, oh, or your petals will crush. Wow. I kind of hope he. I hope he. I see. He, Ooh, he, he yeah. sucks even with this. He should have ended with that Americanized line. He brought yeah, it up halfway that through. Hot. That was hot. He should have ended with it. Yeah. God damn it, Israel! Hope you fucking rotten hell, you piece of shit. Yep. Yep. So, what did you think? That was pretty good. That was good. That, that was, was a good, good vibe. That was a. That was a very good vibe. I like that. There's no way you just poetry slam somebody's suicide note. This we're getting canceled somehow. <laughs> Actually, it doesn't matter. He's a fucking he's a piece of shit. Yeah, fuck him. Yeah. Right, right. Fuck him. 
So there are so many murders and disappearances throughout the country where Israel Keys is at least part of the conversation because either he was confirmed to be in the area at the time of these crimes or believed to be. Uh, maybe there are way more murders than Keyes wanted to admit to because, uh, as he stated in interviews, he doesn't want his daughter to have to grow up with her serial killer daddy's shadow following her the rest of his life. Well, it is. Yeah. So depending on what podcast, subreddit, or expert you listen to, uh, the list of potential victims could go anywhere from a dozen to 50 plus, with many of these alleged potential victims based off little else other than a comment uh, Keyes had made from one of his interviews. So what's our actual number? What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to say 25 to 30. I, I was going to say 23. Yeah, 25 23. to 30. 23. Yeah, so, you know, anybody thinks it's like, you know, from a dozen to 50. Uh, for example, Keyes noted that during the year of 2007, he spent about a week making the trek along the Alcan Highway, oh. which is the Alaskan-Canadian Highway, which stretches from Delta Junction, Alaska. Isn't to- that like on record one of the biggest like serial killer highways? Or, like, their most missing people. The Highway of Tears? Yeah. Uh, that's that's a good question. I think it's the same part. I think the lower part is the Highway of Tears. <coughs> now that you mention it. Uh, yeah, the Dawson Creek, British Columbia s- section. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it extends. It, it stretches from Delta Junction, Alaska, to Dawson Creek, British Columbia. Uh, Keyes was asked if there were any victims there. And Keyes simply responded, Canadians don't count. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. That's not true here, Camille. We love you guys. <laughs> well, we do love our Canadians. Yes. All right. So now uh, some Internet sleuths are now trying to attribute uh, disappearances of any Canadian uh, down the corridor from Alaska to Washington during this time frame to be in the work of Keys. You know, in possible, yeah, probably plausible, probably not. But, you know, whatever. Yeah. Doesn't hurt to look. Yeah. So let's take a look at a few more of these potential murders Keyes may have been responsible for that carry the most weight. Uh, Keyes is believed to be involved in the disappearance and murder of a 12-year-old girl named Julie Harris. Uh, Julie was a double amputee and Special Olympic skier who disappeared on March 3rd, 1996 in Colville, Washington. Uh, We mentioned before that when Keyes was uh, five, I believe, his family moved to Washington and became the white supremacist fucking cult group there. Uh, That was in Colville. Uh, Keyes never confirmed this, and he actually said that after his daughter was born, he changed his outlook about harming children. However, this happened before his daughter was born, and I just think that he's ashamed to admit that he actually did murder and possibly rape children as well. You know, kind of like with the necrophilia thing. Oh, I never did that. Yeah. Never, never, nope. never did it. Yeah, so now I think he's like saying, nope, I never did any children. Anyway, so Keyes, who was around the age of 18 enters the conversation because uh, he was living in Colville, as we just said, at the time, and a friend of Julie's uh, claims that she saw a man who resembled Keyes speaking with the girl at a local community pool and was even able to get Julie's home address and phone number. Uh, Julie Harris's prosthetic feet were found a month later by the Colville River, and her remains were discovered on April 26, 1997, just a few miles away from where she was last seen outside of her church waiting for a ride. There was also Marlene Emerson, age 29, and her daughter Cassandra, age 12, also from Colville, Washington. Uh, Cassie, as she was known, was reported missing after her mother was found dead inside their burned-down trailer on June 27, 1997. Cassie's remains were found about 13 miles from her home in 1998. While this has never been confirmed that these murders were the work of Israel Keys, he did tell police that one of his first acts of arson was a trailer home Mm. in Colville, Washington. Yeah, the coincidence there is too much. Yep. Uh, There are four other possible murder victims from Washington State that Keyes had alluded to during his interviews. Uh, He did own a boat during this time in Washington. Uh, This is uh, post-Army. So he lived in Washington, moved to Maine, entered the Army, moved back to Washington when he got out. Uh, So this is around that time. Uh, He did own a boat and admitted to disposing of at least one of his victims in Lake Crescent, which is about, averages about seven to 800 feet deep, and it's a fucking enormous fucking lake. So good luck finding that. Yeah, those bodies have never been found. So we talked about earlier when uh, Keyes flew into Chicago to visit his mother in Indiana and uh, in June of 2011, less than a week before the Courier murders, uh, Keyes allegedly fell off the earth for about 14 hours. Where did he go? One theory suggests that he traveled to Bloomington, Indiana, 
where a young college student named Lauren Spearier vanished at around 3 a.m. on June 3rd, 2011, never to be seen again. So why is he a potential suspect in this? Uh, he was traveling to Indiana to visit his mom in Fort Wayne, which is about three hours from Chicago, not 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, he could have easily stopped in Bloomington on his way as well, because Bloomington is also three hours from Chicago. Uh, he had visited the Bloomington area three years prior and admitted to stashing one of his kill kits near his mother's home. When questioned by the FBI regarding Lauren Spur, Keyes' whole demeanor changed like he went into a deep trance, became withdrawn as he did when confronted with De- the Deborah Feldman information. Also similar, uh, Lauren Spurrier was also known as a heavy drug user, which appears to be a common theme among some of his victims. Now let's go to February 12th, 2012, shortly after uh, Samantha Koenig's murder. Keyes, his daughter, and Kimberly had just returned from their cruise, and Keyes had dropped off his daughter with family members in Texas as Kimberly flew back to Alaska. Over the next few days, Keyes went off the grid again. On February 15th, 58-year-old James Tidwell Jr. disappeared in Mount Enterprise, Texas. He had just worked the night shift and was last seen heading home. Keyes did tease in his interviews to possibly catching another body while in Texas during this time. Uh, How many men did he limit to? Just a couple, right? No, there was a, a couple men, like one of the Washington victims. He, he was, a man. was a man, yeah. Uh, and, he, and he also mentioned maybe a man in New York as well around the time when he, uh, the whole Deborah Feldman thing. Yep. So uh, he may have say, said man instead of Deborah Feldman to kind of throw them off because yep. they were kind of catching on to, you know, who she was. Yeah, so on February 16th, uh, Keyes claims he broke into another home in a town called Alto, Texas, and waited for the homeowners to arrive back home with the intention of killing them and setting their house on fire to cause a distraction for a nearby bank robbery. Keyes got tired of waiting for the owners, so he went forward with the arson. Authorities believe that the town of Alto that Keyes referred to was actually Aledo, Texas, because his description fits the total destruction of a 3,500-square-foot house and accompanying barn on that specific date. Hmm. Uh, Due to the lack of police response to the diversion... Uh, Keyes decided to forego the local bank robbery and instead traveled to Azell, Texas, and robbed a bank there instead. Now, how does this all tie, tie in with, with James Tidwell? The disguise he wore for this robbery was a white hard hat, identical to the hard hat James Tidwell wore to work, and was wearing a wig that resembled the same color hair as Tidwell. Wow. During one of his interviews... Keyes admitted that the wig he wore for the robbery was human hair. When asked where he got the wig with human hair, Keyes paused, smirked, and responded, you don't have to buy real hair to get real hair. <sighs> this guy is... He, the annoying part is, is he thinks he's, like, clever. Like, you know, but you got caught, like, and you're trying to, like... Set the, he's trying to be, like, the Joker in his interview. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of annoying. yeah. Like, he's trying to be slick. And, yeah, he's yeah. trying to be like, <laughs> hey, you don't need real hair. Yeah, fuck you, dude. Yeah. All right, so that's it for Americano, Snickers, and a cigar. Oh, I'm so happy we re- redid this one. And that story was criminal as fuck. fuck. Yeah, so what would you think? Much better, right? Yes. I had a yes, good time yes, doing yes. this one. Yeah, it was, this was fun. Yeah, I'm glad we redid it. What? Hopefully everybody else feels the same. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully this wasn't another fucking snore fest. Anyway, all right, so that'll do it for this episode of Criminal AF. Thank you all for hanging out with us. Uh, before we go, if you found out what you heard interesting, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, wherever you listen to podcasts, and leave us a review or comment on the episode. And don't forget, head on over to criminalasfuck.com for all of your Criminal AF needs, socials, Patreon, merch store. Merch. S- submit your mail call questions. Submit your dear douchebags. You name it. It's all there. And signing off from Studio Chloroform. Keep your head on a swivel. And stay safe till next time. See ya. Now Now give me our theme music. Executive producers for this episode are Christine Rivera, Beth Davis, Dusty J. Hicks, and Terry Burke Woolen. Associate producers are Paul Hodge, Tara Mazur, Chantel Daggett, Jay Rollins, Courtney Seddon, and Laura Shin. Producers are JD, Trent Gobble, Devin Dean, Ashley O'Connor, Lisa Perello, Alicia Knight, Maria Celine, Chris Owen, Justin Ware, Emily White, Ian Turner, and Jessica Vai. 
The story was researched and documented by Chris Owen. Intro and outro music by David Mercurio. Be sure to follow Curl AF on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, X, and YouTube. Check out all of our merch and many other items at criminalafshop.com.